Hello everyone and welcome to this EPA Days webinar in partnership with their European Commission Research, Research Center. Uh, so for today, we have a really interesting topic about high value data sets in API, like how with APIs we can actually distribute better, uh, make more value, find more uh, innovative ecosystem, uh, but the high value data sets that will be opened to uh, the public, to the developers and the citizens and the business ecosystems, of course, uh, with the new European directive that is uh, that is coming. Uh, and so for that, we have uh, eight speakers and, uh, on different topics from the private sector, from the public sector, who will help us to understand what it, what it will be changing and how public sector organizations, governments, or uh, public institutions can understand the CPI mindset and how they can apply this mindset uh, to the uh, to the, uh, the the high value data sets uh, directive. So for that, I will invite on stage to start and open the the, the webinar. I will invite uh, uh, Monica uh, Posada, Alexander, and Alexandra from the European Commission Research Center and uh, Digit. Thank you very much, Megdi. Uh, very happy to, to be uh, co-sharing uh, yet again uh, these events. Uh, one one of, of these events uh, that create a unique space uh, for dialogue among different stakeholders, in particular public, private sectors, and uh, policymakers uh, on topics related to technical, organizational, and legal aspects of the digital coordination through APIs. Um, I want to uh, uh, also uh, give a, a warm welcome from our side as well to all participants and indeed to our great set of, uh, of speakers today. Um, uh, my name is uh, Monica Posada uh, and uh, I'm a research office, uh, officer at the Digital Economy Unit of the Joint Research Centre. And uh, I've been working on, on uh, analyzing the role of APIs in, in digital coordination for um, quite a number of years now. Um, today we have, uh, uh, can, can, uh, can you, exactly. Uh, the objectives of, of, of today's workshop for us are to identify what are the opportunities that are uh, lying behind the efforts that the public sector will have to do after uh, the mandate of uh, the Open Directive um, for publishing high-value data sets to API. In particular, we'd like to uh, explore what, are the, what kind of uh, returns on investments can be achieved through um, the mo modernizing the technical staff, uh, stack and uh, how uh, invest these investments uh, can have some impact on uh, a better and easier integration of uh, innovators and uh, indeed how to unleash uh, the value that is residing in public uh, sector data sets for um, the public sector, the, the, the business and uh, the, the society at large. Next slide, uh, please. So we have uh, today a quite an intense agenda uh, through uh, and, and in the next uh, three hours, we will have uh, uh, four sections. In the first one, we will try uh, we will uh, explain uh, the relevance of APIs in the policy context, uh, in particular on the um, implementation of the Open Data Directive, and also uh, on the uh, on, on the Interoperable Europe Act. Uh, on the second uh, section, we will explore the opportunities and uh, we will learn from uh, speakers, um, well-renowned uh, experts on APIs and their experiences. The third section will cover um, examples of uh, operational environments that um, are API-driven. Uh, what are the opportunities and challenges that these, uh, these uh, environments have found? And in the discussion panel, we will um, deep dive on uh, how to move forward, how to make uh, the, these very nice objectives uh, um, a reality. Um, with no further delay, I will give the floor to my colleagues in the European Commission, Alexander Kotsev uh, at the GRC, Joint Research Centre, and Alexander Balahur, who is uh, representing the, uh, the Directorate of Informatics of, of the European Commission uh, for setting the policy context of our event. Um, Alex, uh, the floor is all yours. 
Many, many thanks, uh, uh, Monica, and uh, a warm welcome and a good morning from me as well. Uh, my name is Alexander Kotsev, team leader here at the Joint Research Center uh, uh, in the Digital Economy Unit, looking into data sharing from an organizational uh, and a technical perspective. So, as Monica mentioned, uh, allow me to start very briefly by introducing the policy uh, context. So, uh, uh, EU uh, all uh, know uh, the European Commission has six uh, uh, priorities uh, um, uh, that uh, 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 target uh, making Europe a stronger uh, actor in the world, uh, promoting the, our European values and quality and life uh, and way of life, uh, uh, a new push for European democracy and an economy that is citizen centric and works uh, for the people. But there are also two uh, uh, priorities that, uh, that are like flagship, uh, in particular the European Green Deal and the Europe uh, fit for the digital age, which are actually horizontal and that can actually um, uh, reinforce uh, and contribute to the implementation of all the others. And it is clear that uh, thinking of uh, uh, the Europe fit for the digital age in particular, uh, this can hardly be achieved uh, in the absence of data. And uh, in order to leverage on the opportunities that are made uh, 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 available by unlocking data, by making more data available for the uh, European uh, economy, the European Commission launched in 2020 uh, the European strategy for for data with the overall objective to um, create a single market for, for data uh, in the European Union. And this is uh, to be achieved uh, uh, through uh, in, um, different uh, uh, instruments. Uh, there is a horizontal legislation that I will uh, briefly uh, introduce in a second. Uh, uh, the idea, and there is also resource, there is funding available. Uh, uh, that addresses uh, uh, issues such as uh, uh, the improving the data availability, data interoperability, uh, quality of the data. Uh, the European strategy for data and this uh, single market for data is to be achieved uh, uh, through the um, development uh, of sector-specific uh, data spaces uh, uh, in sectors such as uh, uh, health, uh, um, um, industrial and manufacturing, agriculture, uh, mobility, uh, green deal, uh, uh, and so on, uh, and so forth. Uh, looking uh, a little bit uh, into the legal instruments uh, uh, that are part of this uh, um, European strategy for data, we have the Data Governance Act, uh, which uh, 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 is looking into the uh, trust in the data economy, so how uh, the different uh, um, uh, users, uh, how, how to build trust between the users, uh, providers, uh, defines the role of the data intermediaries and also uh, looks uh, uh, into the prominent role of data altruism, so contribution uh, by citizens and businesses of data uh, that can bring some uh, societal benefit. There is also the Digital uh, Markets uh, Act, uh, uh, which is a key element uh, uh, that uh, uh, regulates uh, the way in which uh, big uh, tech operate. Uh, the Data Act uh, uh, in introducing, uh, looking into the fairness in the data economy, so giving the opportunity for uh, exchange uh, uh, of data, giving the opportunity of small and medium enterprises in particular, uh, uh, giving a more uh, fairer um, uh, access to, uh, rights to data uh, holders. And uh, last but not least, very important for the workshop today, we have the Implementing Act uh, uh, for uh, high value data sets under the Open Data Directive, which is in a way uh, defines uh, uh, the uh, public sector uh, data contribution within the, uh, the European strategy for data, within this uh, single uh, market for data. Uh, Moving on to introduce a little bit this implementing act on the high value data sets. So by high value data sets in the, uh, this uh, regulation, uh, this implementing regulation uh, is meant uh, data sets that have a high reusability potential and that can possibly bring uh, important social and economic benefits. Uh, those are to be made available for free under an open license, uh, under a standardized uh, license, CC by 4.0 or uh, less restrictive, in a machine-readable format, 
they are to be made available through APIs uh, and uh, where relevant, also packaged as a book uh, download. And uh, the Implementing Act defines six categories of such uh, high value data sets. So there is uh, geospatial, earth observation and environment, uh, meteorological, statistics, company and company ownership, uh, and uh, mobility. The Implementing Act also uh, defines within those six uh, broad categories, which are the actual data sets that fall uh, under those categories, and some uh, high-level requirements uh, uh, for the, the attributes or for the content, on the granularity, uh, on, the, on the formats, and as mentioned, uh, on the licenses. Um, so, uh, thinking of APIs, uh, and, and those high value data sets, uh, uh, just uh, uh, to mention here that we as Joint Research Center have been investigating this topic uh, uh, for uh, quite some time now uh, from multiple angles, ranging from the technological, but also the legal and organizational uh, perspectives. Uh, and today uh, in the workshop, uh, we would like to uh, dive even de deeper and really uh, look into how uh, APIs, uh, uh, starting from the requirements, the, the legal provisions, but how those APIs uh, uh, can create opportunities. So we, we, we really see opportunities emerging here. We would like to discuss uh, with all the presenters and looking forward to um, uh, draw inspiration from uh, fr fr from their presentation uh, about what are the, the do's and the don'ts when implementing APIs from a governance perspective but also from a technical uh, perspective. And some of the questions that uh, we would be really keen to hear from all of them, uh, and also during the panel, uh, is how to comply to the legal provisions, but at the same time add value to users, something uh, uh, fundamentally important. So not to, just to check a box because there is something required by legislation, but really to, to, to improve, to optimize the efficiency uh, and effectiveness of existing uh, uh, infrastructures, uh, including to, to look at what, how to reduce the costs uh, while um, getting uh, as much as possible uh, from the implementation through APIs. Uh, and also uh, to, to look into questions like uh, uh, how to use APIs in order to modernize uh, legacy systems. Uh, uh, we know that in the public uh, sector where the uh, requirement is, uh, there are lots of legacy systems. So what to do with that? Uh, how, how can APIs uh, uh, improve uh, uh, the situation uh, uh, and modernize, in a way, uh, those uh, legacy systems? So a warm welcome once again uh, uh, from me. Looking forward to everything that is ahead of us. And uh, uh, with that, uh, um, uh, over to uh, Alexandra. Uh, clearly, uh, JRC is not the only actor here. Uh, Digit, uh, um, uh, the, the Digit Informatics uh, has a lot to do with uh, um, um, inter interoperability, uh, technical specification standards, uh, and the like. So over to you, Alex, uh, uh, to introduce uh, your perspective on APIs. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you for the for the invitation to join this uh, workshop. Um, my name is Alexandra Balahur, and uh, I have recently joined uh, the DG Informatics in uh, Unit B2, Interoperability, uh, and I am part of the SEMIC team, so the Semantic uh, Interoperability uh, team. Um, now we'll go to my presentation. Um, I am here to uh, talk to you about uh, the use of DCAT AP for high value data sets. Um, but first, uh, let me introduce you briefly to uh, the SEMIC um, objectives, uh, which is to promote semantic interoperability among the EU member states by promoting the share and reuse of semantic assets, experience and tools and facilitating agreements in key areas. Another objective is identifying opportunities for alignment on semantic definitions, metadata and reference data sources with special focus on the identification and definition of core concepts and vocabularies. And third, um, another objective is raising awareness on the importance of data and metadata management. So the current assets that we have are uh, core vocabularies, so different type of uh, core vocabularies about, 
a person, business, location, public organization, criterion and evidence, and application profiles, uh, of which uh, DCAT AP is the most important one, and um, subsequently different extensions of the DCAT AP. The objectives of DCAT AP are supporting the discovery of access to open data in a cross border and cross domain environment by harvesting data from distributed portals. In the form of an application of profile of W3C DCAT, by expressing constraints and usages of DCAT properties and classes, and including additional properties and usages of control vocabularies. This is done in such a way that the metadata descriptions are maximally harmonized across Europe and provide a reliable source for the European data portal. Extensions to DCAT AP exist to serve different communities better. Such extensions are BREG DCAT AP, GEO DCAT AP, uh, STAT DCAT AP, uh, and others. So how can we uh, employ DCAT AP for high value data sets? So the objective in looking at this extension is to create a common metadata description for high value data sets using DCAT AP in a collaborative way. And for that, we have organized a series of uh, webinars in order to um, understand um, how these common metadata descriptions can be created together with the stakeholders. Uh, the outcome uh, is a document that expresses how to apply DCAT AP in order to satisfy the metadata requirements that are expressed in the implementing regulation for high value data sets, including the API ones. There is a preliminary draft that is um, that can be seen and um, tested uh, that is shared uh, at the link um, and probably uh, we, can, we will share the slide so you can uh, actually click on the link and, uh, and see this uh, preliminary draft if you're interested. Um, this activity is supported by DG Connect for endorsement and alignment with policy implementation. It is supported by Digit uh, CEMIC for editorial and community facilitating services and also by DG Environment and GRC for the alignment with the geospatial community. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, uh, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. No, there is no specific questions, at least from from the audience right now. And I think we can go to the next uh, the next uh, the next session. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandra, Alexander, and and um, and uh, and Monica. So I will just. Um, uh, I will just now uh, share a few minutes on. Um, um, I will just share a few minutes on actually the API mindset to understand. Uh, 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 let's say how you can open the high value data sets for um, uh, for opening uh, uh, for how you can share open high value data sets for APIs. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm sure you can see my slide here. Perfect. I will go full screen. So quickly, I will share three main ideas. Three main ideas. To about what you need to think about for APIs for high-value data sets. So I'm the founder of APIs conferences. I've been I've done consulting over the last 10 years on APIs, and also I'm, I'm teaching at top European business schools about like the programmable business models and the API mindset. And so the, the three main ideas I want to share is the first one is what we call the axiom of the API economy. Uh, the main idea, so I often take this this chart, this this image to explain the supply chain industry, where actually uh, before car manufacturers were doing just one big piece, one, one car themselves, doing all the pieces uh, themselves in one uh, manufacturing, um, 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 uh, in, in one uh, uh, factory. But the thing is, over time, it has specialized into many, many components that now are assembled. So now the car industry has thousands and thousands of suppliers who are actually uh, integrating each other. And this is the same thing that's happening in the data space and the API space. So the high value data sets that you will open will be components in other people applications. So you have to understand that now you have to think in ecosystems and it will be just components integrated at the right place at the right application. So the right, the axiom of the API economy that we share uh, is actually inspired by the quote from this quote from Jeff Lawson, CEO of Twilio, that the world is getting broken down into APIs, that every part of the stack of business 
that the developer might need is eventually turned to APIs that developers can use. So the high value data sets that are actually uh, not used enough or into files that are not easy to use will be opened by APIs that developers can integrate to actually make insightful application. So you can imagine like it's uh, your data will be like building bricks to build high value applications and mixing with other data and other bricks, we will have a, a, a better innovative ecosystem. I'll just take this example of Avalara. Avalara is a company who maintain a huge data sets of tax rate, VAT tax rate. And they do that in the world, but I'll just take the example, the, the American example. In the USA, the tax rate, the VAT, is managed by counties, managed by states. So the high value data sets that they maintain about like what, what is the last legislation, what is the last regulation on this on value added tax in this area is actually extremely useful for e-commerce because every e-commerce card needs to know exactly, according to delivery address, needs to know exactly what's the tax, the tax rate, what's the tax rate for this address, for this product. So this high value data set actually created a huge company because Avalara is a company that's worth $15 billion. So $15 billion and have thousands of employees just because they maintain the high value data sets and they're provided by APIs. So it just, I don't know what high value data sets you have, but just to tell you like how important it can be and how, um, uh, how, how much value it can create. So to finish this first idea, uh, we can understand that organizations, public or private, will provide core data and capability through APIs to others, but they will also consume the core data and capabilities of others through APIs. So this is the supply chain, the digital supply chain, and you have to understand that your high value data sets will be part of the supply chain at the right place, delivering the right value. The second main idea I want to share is that open APIs are superior in terms of efficiency than classic open data to create valuable ecosystems. It can be controversial, but uh, let me explain you why. You know, the distribution of goods in the physical world is really like the factory, the distribution system, supermarkets or, uh, or stores to the end user. But in 21st century, in the digital space, the data and the capabilities are into servers delivered by APIs to developers who will develop application into application supermarkets like app stores to, uh, to deliver to the end users. So this new supply chain needs new rules. And, uh, and the problem is that developers, they prefer APIs than files. CSV, uh, Excel files, uh, flat files, whatever, are a lot more harder to, uh, to use than APIs. Also, the, the files uh, the files are uh, static, you know, it, the data is not updated. I have to re-download the file every time. So, so it's not really uh, uh, useful for developers who want to build the top application with the best citizen experience. So you have to understand that, yes, it's, it's not because you just open data that you will be actually used and useful because it has to also be valuable and extremely easy to use. So APIs enable that. The, last but not least, if you open data via files, the problem is that people will download them and you will not know what they, why they're using the data, for what use case, on what application, on what domain. So with APIs, actually, you have this co constant communication, constant uh, connection with them to be able to know exactly what, what they are doing. And so you can manage a community of developers and give, give back the value uh, to the the, legisl the the policymakers, uh, you can give, tell them exactly like this is how where our our data are actually uh, delivered. This is how it it it, it arrives in the uh, citizen develop the citizen application experience. This is the new public service that have been created thanks to this data. Versus files where actually I've seen many organizations not knowing actually where the data was. So APIs give you this connection, right? It also creates a dependency to you. So you have to be an organization that manage APIs and that, that know how to handle a software service. So that's a new job, but for a new kind of public service versus files where you just send a file, but you don't know and you have never feedback, never return an investment that you can give back to your policymakers. So this is why it's important. And I will just take the example from the private sector. It's called, it's from uh, Martian van Alstein. He's the researcher at the MIT and Boston University. And he just made this research on the businesses, but he showed that businesses who have open APIs have actually 66% more revenues over 10 years, like large businesses, right? You know, public companies and a net income of 38% that is 38% superior. I'm not talking about monetization here, but these high value data sets, but I'm talking about the value it creates. So 
because uh, uh, if the businesses make money with, with that, it means there is a lot of value that, has a, that is actually created. People pay for that. So imagine you deliver these data sets in a way, even you don't monetize them directly, but because it may be uh, paid by the public tax or at some point you have to monetize certain, uh, certain uh, capacities. But just to tell you like, yeah, there is a real economic incentive and real economic value right, by sharing this data that can really spread and trickle down uh, on the whole ecosystem. The third, the third point I want to share, and I'll finish here, is the API landscape. It's just to tell you, yes, you can invest on APIs because the market landscape is ready. So I maintain a landscape of 1,200 tools. We, I cannot dive completely here, but you can uh, check. Uh, you will have access to the slide. You can check. So there's many, many tools which are, which are really mature that you can actually use. Is decomposed to different sections you will be able to find on the on the landscape from lifecycle platforms, backending tools, API as a product, integration platform as a service, or API aggregators. But there is a huge ecosystem that is actually mature to enable you to open APIs. This whole market represents more than $174 billion. So just to tell you, it's mature, it's ready, it's ready to support your government, your public sector initiatives. Right? It's not uh, fancy new tools or fancy new startups doing uh, tools to enable that. No, no, it's actually be, uh, uh, all the type of players who are doing that. And uh, if I share you like really four trends really quickly, uh, we can see from the, the, this landscape. Is the first one is that API management, you know, to manage APIs versus files is really a commodity. So we, we have seen many, many large vendors acquiring many companies. Right, we've seen many. So there is a lot of consolidation. These these offers are really mature, and they are so mature that actually we have a lot of open source tools. So as a public sector organization, you can invest in software vendors, you can invest in open source, but there are open source tools that enable you to really own your API management strategy at, at lower cost. So just to tell you, it's so mature that open source now is a really really valuable uh, uh, also strategy for API management. The second idea I wanted to share is that there's many regulation actually who impact the APIs and API industry. Payment service directive to in-banking, uh, the European health data space that, in, that, that, uh, that promotes the FHIR standard, uh, or GDPR about personal data. Many, many regulation uh, you know, uh, impose the, uh, the, the use of APIs. That leads to specific, in industry, uh, specific solutions emerging in specific industry, especially in the government. So if you check some vendors, if you check some tools on the market, they have government specific solution or public sector specific solution with the right level of security, or whatever. So you can go, you can go there. The trend number four is really the API security. So as a government or public sector is extremely important. So API security is now a standalone market. We have specific tools, right? That are now available on the market who are definitely uh, dedicated to API security. So we really have reached a new level. So API security is not a fear anymore. Uh, you can go there. There are specific tools for API security. Trend number four, uh, there, there is new standards. So new open source standard, the Open API Initiative, Open API, open API standard, ACK API, gRPC, GraphQL, many, many standards which are open standard, recognized standard, enable this interoperability between all the different API uh, uh, strategies. So as government or public sector, if you invest in these standards, you, you're, you're actually embracing a, a, an ecosystem of people have, using the same standards that will enable interoperability, that will ease the developer uh, building application for the uh, end, end citizens. So yeah, so just to sum up, API management is a is is mature and now it's a commodity. Regulation and for the use of APIs, so we will see more and more. I have a data set is one. There is species, species, specialization of API management, especially in government uh, solutions. And also API security is now really also mature. Uh, and really APIs and new standard are really the business infrastructure that you're that you are reading. So I did my time, uh, but yeah, really, I really wanted to show you this mindset. And now we onboard uh, Mark Boyd, who will be able to uh, tell us about how it creates value ecosystem. Hello, Mark, how are you? We can't hear you, Mark. Hey there, great to be here with you all. Yeah, the screen, thank you, Mark. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'll get. I'll uh, start presenting then. Hey everyone, my name is Mark Boyd. 
uh, I use the pronouns he and him. Um, and hang on, let me present. Okay, cool. And so I'm also doing a high level talk. We've got some great presentations that get more into the actual building of the APIs and how that's worked. So I'll leave that to the experts this afternoon. Oh, you know, after this session, um, I'm talking about how using high value data set APIs will generate value in open ecosystems. Uh, I'd like to thank my team uh, who's all contributed in, some, in one way or another to the work that uh, we're doing around this. Um, and what we'll be covering in the next 15 minutes. So first of all, I want to step back and think about what are we talking about when we talk about open ecosystems? How does value flow and get distributed in an open ecosystem? How do they fit in with European Commission strategies? We heard a bit earlier about the European data strategy and the public sector information directive, which is where the high value data sets comes from. And I'll show you how that links into this uh, mindset of open ecosystem. Now, underneath all of that, is an assumption that open ecosystems will enable innovation, but there is a risk around inc increased complexity as well. And so we do already have a solution that the Joint Research uh, uh, commi uh, Committee has already created, which is the API framework for digital governance. Okay, so what are we talking about when we talk about open ecosystems? So at Platformable, where we help develop open ecosystems for different industry sectors, we've come up with this definition, which is drawn from a, a, a whole range of global work that's been done in this area. And an open digital ecosystem is a network of equitable participation opportunities that allow stakeholders to co-create, collaborate, complement, compete, and or coordinate with each other by using common tools and infrastructures. So I want to break that down for a minute. Um, but first of all, before I do that, why open ecosystems? Like, you know, yes, we want to be creating those and we want to use APIs and data to enable them. But why is there the move for that? First of all, because as Mehdi was showing us, it enables faster innovation. It can especially solve wicked problems where we do need a collaboration amongst a whole range of players to solve uh, climate change and the um, and some of the strategies coming out of the green uh, green deal from the European Commission. Um, it can solve things like that, or it can work. It can better help us resolve future issues like future pandemics, uh, and it can help us be able to work on uh, global supply chains and so on. So it enables faster innovation by bringing people together in a way that can collaborate as well as compete. It also builds on the current paradigm where we're shifting from where businesses and governments are moving more to become platforms that offer components like uh, web services or APIs and data that can then be reused to create digital products and services. And again, we've seen, uh, we've heard from Medi about how that sort of broke down the car and instead it's just those sort of components and aspects that can then be rebuilt into new offerings. And finally, for governments and uh, government departments, it can reduce costs by sharing data across systems. So each department or each government doesn't need to create its own data set. It can draw on the high value data sets that have already been created at the European Commission level, uh, at another uh, level within government or by another uh, uh, member state within the European Commission, uh, European Union, and then be able to use those data sets. So, so it increases the, um, uh, the efficiency of governments as well. Okay, so that's why. Let's go back to that definition. So an open network, uh, we said it's a network of equitable participation opportunities. So what uh, what uh, APIs and uh, what open ecosystems do is make sure that there's no barriers to entry and participate. It may require accreditation. So FinTech, for example, needs to be able to demonstrate that they can be responsible with managing and using uh, uh, uh managing um uh, customer uh bank accounts and so on if they're linking from open bank apis uh into um in, into their budget app or their payments app or whatever so there, there is the need for accreditation and there may need in the future there may need to be a certain area of um uh, of monetization around the apis so for example something like galileo um from the, from Europe, as far as all of the um, uh, global um, uh, mapping data and so on, if there was an organization like Google that wanted to um, pull all of that data in, for example, maybe there's a good rationale for having a price there 
for for that sort of large big tech to be able to draw in all of the data at once but there will be a free tier or there'd be a small uh, there'd be no cost for a smaller supplier who wanted to make use of that for a smaller app or or, or for the for their sort of um a specific use case so you may act, so but overall there's no barriers there's no sort of fundamental reason that you cannot participate in an open ecosystem Secondly, um, it involves it allows all stakeholders. So that includes governments and regulators, industry associations, enterprises, small businesses, researchers, community groups, and individuals to all be able to uh, make use of the open ecosystem. Uh, also, the, the, we talk about new forms of collaborating. So when Medi was talking about the old world of manufacturing, it was really a world of like building a product and then the company sells that product to the consumer, they may have supplier relationships to get certain um, raw materials and so on, but it's really just a transactional process. Whereas what we see in an open ecosystem is that at some times you're co-creating, you're collaborating, collaborating, sometimes you are competing. So we see this in standards uh, creation, for example, where you may have uh, com companies involved with governments working together on developing a standard. So they're coordinating and collaborating together. But then once that standard is created, they're going to go away and use that in their products and they're competing with those products. So there's a whole range of sort of more nuanced uh, and, and uh, different hats that different stakeholders are wearing depending on the on the work that they're doing together and that then means that there's a whole new kind of supports that are developed there's data sharing agreements there's the work that european commission has led around some of that data sharing where there's a recognition that at some levels uh industry needs to share some data points but there are other data points that are recognized as commercial in confidence and so they wouldn't share those so having that split understood where the shared data around something like a uh, supply chain optimization might mean that you are uh, that everyone involved in the shipping industry needs to be able to share a certain level of data but then what is actually the levels of being of, of what's being shipped or what um companies are being shipped um, and so on might be part of that commercial incompetence. Then there's new revenue sharing pathways. Again, I think Medi was talking about how in this world, those who are maybe contributing or enhancing data might be able to um, be provided with some sort of revenue cost. The API provider is provided, or maybe the app um, that's being developed at the end is, is, um, being, uh, is, is a, a fee for service app. And then they're sharing some of those costs, that, uh, some of their revenue that's generated back with the API providers and so on. And then API terms of service, there's been some work done from the European Commission recently through the JRC around what will be the ideal terms of service so that makes it easier to read and understand for uh, being able to arrange these sorts of new types of relationships. Uh, common tool with, you know, so in the open ecosystem, you're using common tools. So that's the APIs. That's the open standards and the open data models that we heard from Alexander earlier. For, for example, the work that's being done out of Digit to be able to create uh, some semantic uh, di uh, directories and dictionaries that ensure that there is this sort of um, global sort of data models that are being, or European wide data models that are being used when you're describing APIs and the data that's being drawn from. And then also we heard about the data catalogs and so on. So those sorts of tools being commonly used um, for, for developing an open ecosystem, really important. And then finally, there are the infrastructures. So we're going to hear later today from Cohen Adolfs, who's one of the world leading experts in open banking. Um, and he'll, uh, I'm sure he'll be talking about some of the digital payments infrastructure. But that's a model that's being used globally now for um, uh, that, that's moving banking towards that sort of um, global digital infrastructure in, in an open ecosystem sort of manner. We'll probably see that in supply chain infrastructure. It'll happen with the um, environmental, social and governance infrastructure and the, the regulations that are being developed. Again, European Commission leading on some of those um, patents. And then also there's some global work on the free flow of data agreements. Again, all of these infrastructures enabling a move from an to an open ecosystem. 
So how does value flow in an open, open ecosystem? Here, let's look very quickly. Like I say, I don't want to get too much into the banking examples because we've got some great speakers later today who are able to do that. But really, Europe's leadership around the second payment services directive has influenced the globe around moving from bank banking from an oligopoly sort of model into something where there can be more players, more consumer choice, um, uh, hopefully redress the power differentials where banks are deciding who gets financed, um, what products are available into a more of a eco open ecosystem where consumers are choosing a whole more, a much more diverse range of products and solutions. So here you can see, you know, regulations come in like the second payments directive. Um, then there's work done on, uh, on governance and uh, standardization. Banks and fintech might build the APIs then that goes through as far as how well they're built. We heard again from Medi talking about developer experience, how well they're built, how secure they are, how uh, digital ready the consumer market is or the population and uh, small and medium businesses are. They're using, they're drawing on the tools that are built by API providers. And then as a, role, as a result, these are API consumers. They're people, they're organizations that are, and businesses that are using the APIs to build new solutions, fintech and so on. And then out of that, they're um, distributed and then they're available to end users, individuals, uh, small and medium businesses, large businesses, enterprises, and so on. And then that has benefits then from society to society as well. So uh, greater consumer choice, faster ability to do things without having to wait in lines, so on. So there's some of the societal benefits, fintech, um, are able to add to then the um, economy um, through both um, taxes, but also through employing more people. Um, and also there's efficiencies in all of this as far as being reducing the um, burden of doing things because it's a great, it's more uh, resource uh, efficient way of doing things. And then environment, again, because of that resource efficiency, then being able to reduce carbon costs and so on if it's done really well. So that's how data flows. And then we've got arrows that show where, you know, the um, fintech, they get the, the, you know, people pay certainly for some of these services. And then that drives backwards going back to the API providers and so on. It's a similar idea in open health as well. This is some work we did for World Health Organization. The It's a very similar map, you know, some different players here. And also we've put in this a bit more uh, clearly here, which is all of the data governance components, which are really essential in an area like open health. They are in open banking and um, as well, but open health, people talk about the personal data and the sensitivity of that data. So it's really important to demonstrate that there's these, uh, uh, that the high level of data governance is in place and all of the data governance components help support that and that flows through then to generate trust so that people are willing to share their health data in order to get new products and services, which might end up with uh, improving health, um, individual outcomes, population health, reducing health inequalities and reducing the uh, costs of, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, health uh, service delivery. How does all of that fit in then with the European uh, data strategy that we heard about earlier? So we've heard about the data spaces, bringing together relevant data infrastructures and governance frameworks in order to facilitate data pooling and sharing. So just very quickly looking at that open health ecosystem, in this case, Europe, for example, the European health data space might be able to encourage the adoption of uh, uh, open data models, open standards, and data governance practices. They are involved in being able to set up regulations that set who can share and access data and for what purposes. And then being, a, a being part of then having this system in place, what you really want is the European health data space should be able to monitor that the impacts of an open ecosystem is enabling participation and is generating the uh, value that's expected, including the fact that Europe is then seen as an area for increased research and innovation dollars um, for and be a trustworthy place to do business. 
Um, then all, if we now look at the role of the Public Sector Information Directive and the whole role of the high value data sets in amongst all of this idea of an open ecosystem, then here we have like, let's look at the open banking, for example, we've got a number of data sets, we heard about those categories, I went through and had a look at some of the breakdown of some of these, you know, disposable income data set, industrial production, tourism, companies, population, so on. So banks and fintech, can use these data sets to identify new product ideas, new target markets, better identify, identify solutions to problems. Then out of that, regulars, regulators will be able to use things like companies' data to monitor who gets finance. So under old open banking rules, uh, women-owned businesses and uh, migrant-owned businesses were really disadvantaged and weren't getting their fair share of um, loans and so on. So in the move to an open ecosystem, a digital uh, global infrastructure, you would hope that that disparity and the power differential there would be addressed by the new open banking ecosystem. So it will be really important to use companies' data as a means to be able to check whether or not more businesses were able to participate through gaining financing. At present, the European level companies data doesn't break it down by uh, gender or country of birth of the, um, of the business founders. But there is a note in the public sector information directive that says regardless of this, um, the, especially in the areas of company ownership, member states are encouraged to go beyond the minimum requirements. So I really urge those who are involved in companies' data at the, gov at the um, member state level to really consider trying to add those so that it can be value valuable in an ecosystem like open banking to see whether or not those disparities around uh, participation opportunities are being redressed as we move to this global digital infrastructure. But overall, you know, there is also then, because of all of this use of the data, the goal then will be that, that there's increased innovation for European businesses in a global uh, marketplace. So in a lot of cases, what we're talking with open banking and open health, it's a global uh, open ecosystem that's developing and really Europe's role is to, one to be a part of a leadership group around how that can function most effectively but also make sure as this last point made that European businesses are well positioned in that. So the assumption then is that innovation is en enabled so if we think of a program logic model it moves from data is available so banks and then fintech are able to analyze using that data and identify new opportunities. So that results in more fintech and more diverse in uh, fintech. And then that in turn means that there's greater choice for uh, customers, less business costs, and regulators are able to ensure that the, all members of society are being serviced by the new digital products. So that's the goal of the, um, so that's the key assumption in moving towards an open ecosystem, if you like. But the key risk is that there's complexity. So if each country creates their own high value data sets their own way, for example, then that means there's 27 high value data sets uh, in each country, each slightly differently. There's 31 directorates of the European Commission. They may also have some data sets that they're all done differently. There's however many agencies and services, however many, many regional governments. Uh, Patrick Amarelli Amor from um, uh, Dinam or in the past was working at Dinam in France. And when they were building their API government, he was saying that there were 100 national departments, 36 regions, 36,000 municipalities in France. So if they were doing all of their own high value data sets slightly differently and in their own way, then each developer who's trying to then get to that innovation and build the fintech has to understand how those differences at each little level in order to get the full data picture. So the solution here is the API framework for digital governments, which came out of uh, some work from JRC a few years ago. Um, so it's available. There's a, a link here. So when the slides are available, you'll be able to see, see through it, although you can uh, search API framework for digital governments and it comes up. Um, so what we looked at then was three levels, strategy, tactics, and operations. And we identified four areas. You've got to work on policy support, building out platforms, enhancing people's skills, and developing the right processes. So anyone who's developing a high value data set across Europe, we encourage you to use this API framework to be able to design the APIs in a way that's going to reduce that complexity risk. So for example, um, just to end on this, 
at the API strategy level, as we heard from Alexander, Digit's doing some work on standardization, and there's also the da relevant data spaces are doing work, and I'm sure there's other European-wide networks. So you'd be working to ensure that you're part of those conversations so that as you're building your high-value data set, you're using like a standard template or a standard data model for your API that's conforming to everywhere else so that there's less complexity being introduced into open ecosystems at that level. As has, has ha happened with PSD2, there was some, you know, there's complexity because they didn't do this. So banks created their own APIs, which might not be the same as every other bank in the same country. So, you know, P uh, the um, uh, third uh, payment services directive is already talking about how that might be something they're going to try to address in order to make sure that the open ecosystem functions uh, functions more effectively. At the API tactical level, so at the department or the government level that's allocating resources, you really need a product manager and a technical owner. So the product manager is thinking about who's going to use this API or the high value data set. What are they going to use it for? Is it fit for purpose? Is it functioning correctly? Is it really able to enhance, enhance value? And they're also involved in that measuring the impacts of the use of that high value data set to ensure that there's that participation and opportunity for everyone um, to be able to get value out of these. And finally, at the operational level, we've got a whole series of recommendations. One of the key ones would be using open API specifications uh, for each API before you're starting to design or build it so that there is a sort of a, a description of the API. Again, that's machine readable, so you can use it in your testing uh, regimes and so on, but it also enables a developer to come along, have a quick read and understand, okay, I, I get what this API is going to do. So or there's a lot more recommendations as well as in that API framework, but I'd suggest that as a starting base for when you are working on your high value data sets. It's also written in a way where if you've already started your work, you're able to align it without, it's not a linear process. So you can look at the recommendations and see how to weave those in if that work has already begun. Okay, I think that's everything from me. Um, uh, thanks very much. Please feel free to stay in contact um, and, and reach out if you'd like to learn more. Cheers. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. We're a little bit over time, but uh, uh, we will keep the questions during the panel at the end where some 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 of the speakers will be there to, to answer all these questions. Thank you very much. The healthcare ecosystem is is something uh, with a lot of high value data sets, a lot of sensi sensitive data sets too. Uh, so yeah, but thank you for, for sharing that. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. And, and we'll continue uh, right at the fast pace, but we will continue our, our, with our next uh, speaker um, on stage uh, to talk about like developer portals, monetization, how you can make your APIs more uh, and your data more uh, available, distrib distribute them better uh, in, with the API mindset. So and for that, we have Alexander, Alexander in French, but Alexander Ervo from Blubber. Hi, Alexander. How are Hi, you? Hi, Mehdi. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, the stage is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm the, I'm the CEO of, uh, of Blobber. And uh, what we do at, at Blobber is that we help companies who have APIs to create their developer portals to monetize APIs. We have more now than uh, 200 customers. So it helps us to, uh, to have a good picture of how people are doing things now. And we have done as well um, a, a study on the top 100 API uh, companies in the world to understand how they share APIs and how they monetize them. So I am, I'm going to wear my two hats to, to share insights about how, how people do things. Um, I will try first to, to give you a, a picture of how we see at the API economy, how we look at the API economy at Blober, uh, and give you some examples, real, real life examples of companies that are monetizing, I think, uh, uh, data that are quite similar to the high, high uh, value data sets that you want to monetize, potentially. Um, and as well, uh, give you some insight about what we've learned about the, the companies that are monetizing APIs. So how to think about the API economy? Um, we see like uh, four different things about the API economy. Uh, I, I would say four different uh, pillars. One is when you want to create a new uh, business through your APIs. Typical example is uh, Stripe. An ex another example, um, uh, another pillar is to grow your distribution, distributional uh, channel. So uh, typical example here as well is a TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor uh, provides an API where you can 
uh, consume the API on other websites to book trips. So it brings uh, like an uh, additional uh, uh, revenue channel for them. The other thing is uh, to increase stickiness of your API. So when you open the API, it, it's going to, uh, to, to open the new opportunities and uh, uh, make your, your, your software potentially more sticky and then upsell customers uh, as uh, an API to provide a new business line to your, to your customers. Definitely here, we are focusing more on creating new business. Uh, I think it's uh, the most relevant uh, part uh, for, for the today discussion. Um, so looking at this in details, uh, I have two examples I wanted to share with you. Um, two examples from companies that are monetizing APIs. One is Meteonomics. So it, it's, uh, it's a company part of uh, Vetter, the German uh, data agency, where they monetize weather and the pollen data uh, information based on location. Uh, they've created a lot of different products, API products to monetize their uh, APIs. Um, the other example is electricity maps. Uh, what they provide is actually the carbon intens intensity for each electric, uh, sources, electricity sources. So everywhere in Europe and in the world, you can find, depending on the location, what is the carbon intensity of uh, electricity. Really good and, uh, and used. It's the, the solution used uh, in uh, many applications now. Uh, to uh, which are uh, uh, environmental uh, um, uh, focus. An example about how they do it today at Electricity Map, they have created a portal of different API products where you can see that there are some free products, paid products, and they can have like an onboarding session with uh, their users where they can try try out by themselves the free, uh, free trial. And then they can uh, consume data from different countries uh, having like a, um, um, uh, a way to, uh, uh, to monetize different and package the data from different uh, countries. So uh, they have customers which are really startup scale-ups and they start to have very large companies as well that are consuming the APIs. And those companies that are consuming the APIs are quite often uh, um, um, do not uh, have like a product that is uh, uh, displayed directly on the API portal, but they might build specific products for large companies to tailor to their, uh, to their specific needs. So an API portal can adapt to the needs of the small companies, medium companies, and as well the large companies. Now moving to uh, the lessons that we have learned from our customers and studying all those uh, different API portals, um, is that you need to have an API product approach. So really trying to uh, focus uh, your API to, uh, to to package it in a specific way so that it's tailored to a specific need to, for the end users uh, so that they can easily understand your API because otherwise you are you have the risk to offer a huge HTML page with all the things that can do your API but not really laser focus on the problem that it's solving. So it's important to have this product approach around APIs to really have a use case approach on that. Um, what we see as well as a, as a, as a feedback is um, companies do not monetize based on API calls. That's pretty a bad practice. Uh, this, seems, this seems like uh, the obvious way to uh, monetize because you offer uh, uh, re request access to, uh, to your data. But what is the be better way to uh, monetize is to use a value metric. So trying to understand which value you provide uh, to the end users and uh, work back uh, what is the, the content that is valuable and understand on which metric you should build against. So for instance, it could be uh, based on the carbon intensity. It should be based on the country's specific data that you provide. Uh, if I take the example of electricity maps, if I take the example of uh, meteonomics and the weather data, it can be uh, really specific to uh, end users where you can capture uh, the value of pollen, of weather information, of uh, uh, wind pressure, um, um, all those kind of, of, of things that uh, can be monetized separately and where you can better capture the value that you provide to, to your end users. Then in terms of business models, um, what, we, um, what we see uh, as a key learning uh, is that there is always the monetization dilemma, that's how we call it, uh, is between having like a, a prepaid model, so saying like you are going to have a subscription model where you uh, you uh, you make you ask for the payment upfront, 
or you have like a postpaid model where you have more value-based uh, pricing, where you're going to monetize based on uh, the consumption that is really done by the end user. Of course, prepaid is good because you get uh, uh, the, the cash uh, uh, upfront. Uh, the, the caveat is definitely that you cannot really capture the value that you provide to your end users because you do not have this pay-as-you-go model. And the pay-as-you-go model, you get paid at the end of the, of the period. And what we see is that uh, there is a 5 to 10% revenue that you lose because the credit card are not updated. Uh, 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 there is not sufficient uh, amount uh, to to pay for the for the for the products, so that's really hard and the business that, that is lost. And what we see as a upcoming in a way to to monetize the the APIs is to shorten the billing cycle and to monetize uh, to, to to bill every uh, every week or every two weeks, but based on the value based model, so that you reduce your risk that you are not going to be uh, paid at the end of the month, for instance. Now looking at the, the pricing, looking at uh, the top 100 API portals uh, in the world and as well uh, uh, from our customers, we see that um, there is kind of a trend on, on the pricing APIs. Um, the pay-as-you-go, that's quite hard. Uh, the, the top API uh, companies, they seem to have a low pay-as-you-go pricing because they understand better than others the value metric. So they, uh, they really capture the value metric at a granular uh, level so that they can have like a, a, a good entry price for a pay-as-you-go model. But then for the subscription uh, model, we see that there is average price of uh, 185 and uh, there is not a huge distribution of the price around this uh, average price uh, as an entry price. However, when you want to monetize uh, your APIs more than uh, uh, 1,000 euros, we see that it should not be like a public price on the API portal. And quite often, this is like a custom product that is created add-on based on the needs of different uh, developers and companies. And it needs to have like a discussion uh, with the end users who have tested before uh, smaller packages, smaller uh, or free uh, options of the API bef before moving to this, uh, to this paid option. Finally, um, what we have seen as well in terms of features that are the most interesting ones, uh, for the top API companies is they, they do things differently um, for the self-registration of the APIs, uh, having like uh, SDKs as well that are uh, available, uh, onboarding as well email, but not only the onboarding, really the communication with developers using the API, not only at the time that they uh, pay, subscribe to the API, but as well when they use the API with continuous uh, communication. Uh, customer examples, they have really good customer examples for end users to figure out how they can use the API and implement it. And then they have uh, uh, excellent uh, FAQ and uh, error descriptions to help uh, as well the uh, developers to be uh, 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 onboarding super, super quickly. Now opening on, the, on the, another topic that uh, um, we see uh, a lot now and that is impacted as well on monetization. Um, is how LLMs are as well changing the API ecosystem because uh, the traditional way was definitely an API that is being used uh, um, by a developer to be integrated in the application. And then from the application, the end users can use the application and consume indirectly uh, the API. Now, uh, the new way, it's not that it's over for this traditional way, still uh, it will continue, of course, but the new way is that new users are coming as well using uh, large language models like uh, ChatGPT and consuming uh, APIs directly in those uh, large language models. So there is like the release uh, soon of the ChatGPT plugins. Uh, large language models are as well using, using agents to consume APIs directly. So it brings as well new challenges and new opportunities in terms of uh, monetization. And that's it for me. Happy to, to stay in touch uh, through LinkedIn. And uh, if you have any question about, around monetization, happy to, to share more. We have really one really quick question about the free aspect. So of, co of course, you're, specialized, you're, you're a specialist on uh, monetization, like uh, 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 direct monetization, but indirect monetization, like um, do, you have also, do you see also a company who have a, a big free tier to have re really indirect monetization model, you know, like uh, building third-party application marketplaces or stuff like that? Yes, we have as well uh, uh, companies like this. So 
this is not our uh, core focus, but we have companies as well doing that. And um, for those companies, it's uh, hard to say for me the economic value that it provides because they do not share economic value about uh, the, the price for them. But definitely, they invest a lot of uh, time and, uh, and money to, uh, to open their, their APIs. So it's more like the either to open the distributional uh, channel um, or as a, a, a possibility to be more sticky with their customers. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alexander. And we will see you in the panel later uh, today. Thank you very much, Alexander. Okay. And so we, uh, we continue uh, with our next speaker to understand, like, from the private sector, how open APIs have been is great, and also how in, in the organization, how things have been uh, changing. And for that, we have Kun Adolfs. Hello, Kun. Hello. I hope that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. And you have a great okay. example to share about all the journey you've made uh, about open banking beyond the regulation, but actually about uh, what it has created on top of that. So I'll, uh, this, the, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Kun, for being with us. Thanks. And uh, yeah, so my name is Kun Avels. I had some, uh, I work at a bank. I have some uh, security issues with logging into the systems uh, this time. Normally it's uh, working okay. So. I need to say that I uh, go uh, from the one slide to the uh, to the other. Um, I'm Kun Adels. I'm lead, no, uh, yeah. I'm now head of APR portfolio at ABN Amro. Uh, and today, uh, yeah, indeed, next slide. Uh, I would like to give an introduction on APIs, how we sell it to the business, uh, why it's in a business strategy and not IT only. Uh, where are we at? And then let's build uh, personal banking in a, in a digital age. Um, next slide. Uh, to give an introduction on ABN AMRO, uh, yeah, I think a lot of you uh, might know us. We are uh, one of the three major banks in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we have several business lines, so retail banking, private banking, commercial banking, and corporate institutional banking. Um, and uh, yeah, APIs are, of course, an important uh, topic uh, to build new functionalities for each of those business lines. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, APIs for a long time have been something for IT. So when I started a couple of years ago, I needed uh, content to share why APIs are important and also how it has been driving innovation in other business lines. And I've used, uh, I've used this uh, slide many, many times to explain how uh, applications like Uber are uh, built where Uber is not uh, mapping the whole world into their own systems on their own. They reuse what others already have been uh, uh, building and using. Um, and same for payments. Uh, now, the examples also show uh, how Sonos has uh, reused what Spotify and Deezer has been using. Philips Hue, how it's integrated uh, with Apple HomeKit and other ecosystems and iCrony Club in a similar way. And then to show what an API uh, actually is, and that is uh, technical, but it's also easy uh, to understand. I always show a piece of code on the right side showing what the interface actually looks like. Uh, and if you then look at, for instance, the Uber API, you see that there is a request. It is um, yeah, accepted. There's a phone number of uh, Bob, who is the cab driver. Uh, there's a location from A to B, and Bob is driving the Bugatti Veyron with the license plate, I love Uber. And this is a piece of code that someone know, that needs to connect the Uber API, for instance, to Philips Hue. Uh, so uh, you can turn on the light screen when the uh, cap is at your place. Uh, next slide. If you then look at ABN Amro, for many, many years, we've been developing our digital channels. So we started with internet banking in, uh, in 2000, mobile banking in uh, 2011, uh, video banking and other digital channels have come across as well. And then API banking or open banking or embedded finance is a topic that has been growing uh, in uh, 2018 and on. Uh, but it's important to know that below all these channels, you need similar infrastructure. So while we uh, might discuss uh, open APIs on these kind of events, so how do you innovate together with third parties, you also need enterprise APIs, internal APIs to align the customer journeys across all your uh, channels. And 
uh, to create a logical uh, IT infrastructure as well. And those are connected journeys. And that's something that I would like to share in today's story. Next slide. So within ABN AMRO, uh, we, uh, yeah, so our ambition is to become uh, the personal bank in the digital age. And we often uh, talk about the Z model in this regard. So uh, in, the, in the past, when you would develop uh, IT, then you would do point-to-point uh, -point connections and create all kinds of spaghetti. Uh, that is IT in the early stages of, uh, of IT. And that's something that you, know, you definitely need to change. So point-to-point -point connections is not something that you uh, uh, should have in your organization anymore. Uh, we always uh, want teams to build enterprise APIs, which are reusable building blocks that teams then can use to uh, yeah, develop their channels. On the right side, you can also see that Z slide, the Z shape, where we have enterprise APIs, uh, which are connecting our own backends and the backends of partners, FinTech, Big Techs, towards ABNMRO uh, app and also to our web channels. And then we have open APIs where we can offer our capabilities towards uh, third parties. So those can be uh, partners, FinTech, Big Tech, uh, subsidiaries, et cetera. Next slide. Um, if you have a good portfolio of APIs, uh, then also the mechanism is going to change. So in the past, uh, if you have if you have all the knowledge or you have all the capabilities, then you can only build uh, the innovations and customer experiences your own because you own everything. Well, uh, if you open up your APIs and those can be internally, so within the ABNMRO ecosystem, then you allow teams within ABNMRO to become creative on the mechanisms that someone else already has built. And if you open up even more, uh, towards the ecosystem to uh, third parties as well, they can help you to innovate uh, as well. So then you come to centralized innovation towards distributed uh, ways of working and monolithic uh, mechanism to networks uh, innovation. Uh, next slide. What we do see though, is that uh, APIs is still a uh, journey. So uh, in the past, we invested a lot in um, our own colleagues to believe why our digital ecosystems important, how can APIs contribute to it. Uh, we enable them with uh, API platforms, developer portals, uh, internal consultants to develop APIs. We uh, set up uh, support mechanisms to develop uh, APIs uh, and also support capabilities that once those teams have developed uh, APIs and they want to offer that to uh, other teams or to um, external uh, customers that those consumers of the APIs can reach those uh, uh, teams as well. So we supported them in many ways with platforms, mechanisms, consultancy, etc. And only if you have that all in place, you see that teams want to change because all the uh, prerequisites are there. But there is also a common understanding and belief in uh, yeah, how this might change the future of banking. What the interesting part is that is that the same journey that we had to do internally where everybody needs to understand about enterprise and open APIs, uh, especially for the open APIs part, that is still an ongoing journey when we talk uh, with our uh, corporate customers. So some of those customers are well aware of IT and APIs and they have their own developers and they once they come into a struggle, uh, they know like oh, an API could help me to automate uh, our processes or to create new customer experiences. But we also have a lot of customers that are not there yet. And we need to uh, bring them uh, along in our journey on what are the possibilities of the capabilities that we offer in our developer portal, which customer journeys or internal problems can uh, companies help to solve. Um, and what do you need to organize in your own organization? So having a product owner and a few developers uh, that can help you to create those new uh, journeys, of uh, automations or customer journeys. Uh, next slide. 
So as shared, we recognize various types of APIs. So private APIs are the APIs that uh, we only have uh, within a team. So no one else can connect to that capability. And only the team within AB Namro is allowed uh, to, uh, yeah, to uh, build connections on, uh, on that regard. Um, enterprise APIs are the ones that uh, we use internally uh, as reusable components. So that can be create an account uh, or uh, initiate a payment um, or create a mortgage. You want those customer journeys to be aligned in internet banking or in the app, etc. And uh, for some uh, ones, we can also uh, choose to open up them uh, towards third parties. So of course we have the PS2 APIs, which we uh, opened up uh, because of regulation. So third parties can uh, yeah, create overviews on the account information and they can initiate payments. But we also have foreign exchange trade, Tiki, what is a peer-to-peer um, uh, -peer, uh, payments request application um, and business account um, APIs that we offer to our corporate customers so that, uh, they can create new customer journeys and automations on, on top of that. Next slide. Um, and uh, I uh, see that the slides are uh, changing a bit because of the uh, security issues, sorry for that, but um, uh, the important part is that integration is business strategy and it's not IT only. So if you look at everything that we offer in our internet banking and mobile banking apps, um, a capability is to initiate a payment. And of course you want that to be a similar experience if you open up uh, the internet banking uh, website uh, or the ABM Enro app. Um, once you create those internal, those enterprise APIs for your own channels, you can also choose to open up them towards third parties. And uh, for instance, based on the uh, APIs that we created for uh, transaction uh, services, uh, we created also uh, the Tiki payment request application, who then again offers a API that third parties can uh, consume. So uh, with Tiki, you can send via WhatsApp a payment request. Um, and for instance, DHL is using uh, that uh, API uh, for their uh, uh, colleagues who are entering, uh, yeah, who are delivering packages to your house. And if they need to have an additional payment, they can use Tiki to uh, settle that with the customer. Also the Dutch Railways, is using Tiki as uh, an application uh, to uh, yeah, give back uh, money when you deliver the pet bottle on the train station. So there is a Dutch regulation, European regulation as well, that um, uh, yeah, there needs to be a, a kickback fee on the bottles and also uh, cans. And with Tiki, uh, you can give customers a little bit of money back uh, via an easy to use way. Uh, then again, also uh, SMS parking uh, is using Tiki to park your car so th that you can pay uh, when you park your car at a certain uh, spot. But what they also uh, encountered is that customers uh, were uh, trying to do fraud in that mechanism and they needed a solution to check the ABAN, uh, IBAN account with the name. Um, and we already solved that by using a fintech product of uh, SurePay, uh, who is offering IBAN name check control in our own uh, apps. And we decided to resell that capability towards third parties as well, so they can uh, improve uh, the fraud mechanisms in their systems as well. A last example from this slide is Bugs. And Box is a fintech, and basically they are using the ABM Amro uh, backends for uh, clearing uh, for investments. So uh, ABM Amro uh, offered uh, as uh, first uh, bank together with Box um, uh, the capability of doing fractional investments and also normal investments, and the settling of that has been uh, done via the ABM Amro backends, and we offer APIs towards the fintech Box so they can create the customer experiences and products uh, on top of that. 
Two other examples on the next slide. Uh, is one is of travel essence and travel essence is for instance using our foreign exchange trade api to automate currency conversions and other tra uh, treasury processes if you want to take a look we have a video on uh, this case on our developer portal uh, but it's very nice to see that uh, it is maybe a number of customer that for many many years they did a lot of manual work uh, to do their treasury processes and via our api they uh, can automate these kind of uh, uh, types of works uh, with a click of uh, a button the next use case is on the next slide and that is brookhuis and brookhuis is a, one of the uh, bigger car selling companies within the netherlands and they are using the business account payment api uh, to set up new payment experiences and faster delivery of cars. So in the previous times, uh, once a customer was coming to, uh, to get their car, three days ahead, they needed to pay for their car in order for uh, Bookhuis to see that the payments uh, actually happened and uh, before they can give uh, the, the car uh, yeah, away with the customer. Uh, because of the uh, business account payment API, they are now able to uh, see, uh, so the business account payment API combined with the business account inside the API, they are now able to see that a customer has uh, paid immediately uh, and um, uh, yeah, the, the employee in the office can see that result immediately as well. So there is a three days handling time is suddenly gone which is definitely improving the customer experience in, uh, in many, many ways. So on the next slide, uh, basically why our corporate customers are using our APIs is because they offer real-time interactions with data, real-time access, efficiency, security, because it's reducing the manual tasks. It is uh, enabling connectivity and flexibility. So uh, the corporate customers uh, can create all kind of uh, own new customer experiences. So on the next slide, um, please, if you would like to know more about our API products, uh, go to developer.abnmro.com and there you will find a lot of uh, information on our products. Um, then I'm going through the next slides a bit quickly, but I would like to share a bit on uh, it's important to know that uh, it is quite a journey. The API journey, transforming a business towards API first. Often we discuss uh, the digital business transformation from the perspective of that everything uh, of everything that's above the water. So the outside uh, in business development. Um, so with uh, PNC2, uh, for instance, or also other API products, we see often the result of the interface that has been offered. But to come to create, yeah, to come to that API and creating that API, it uh, requires a company to see that API as a product, to uh, see what developers need to uh, develop successfully on that API, to implement lifecycle management on that API, uh, having the correct application architecture uh, so that everything is uh, secured as well. Uh, compliance and security needs to be an, uh, yeah, enhanced and, and set up. So there comes a lot to it to develop a, a certain, uh, certain API. Uh, on the next slide, we also um, uh, present how we discuss internally the benefits of APIs. So I discussed the enterprise and open APIs and still often we need to convince or share why APIs are so important. So uh, untangling IT, uh, creating future-proof uh, IT is one of the big reasons why APIs need to be built. Next, of course, APIs contribute to that um, ecosystem where you can help to innovate each other, so boost business. And the last one, uh, the uh, yeah, part of the storyline that we often share is that APIs streamline cooperation. So basically it's creating that digital contract internally and externally or between two teams where it becomes very logically uh, set what capability someone is offering to someone else and what what you can build with it and whatnot 
uh, and what the prerequisites are of uh, creating such an experience. So on the next slide, we also have an overview of what we have built on the next slide. Yep, we also have created an overview of what we have built uh, within ABN MRO uh, to secure those APIs and to offer those APIs towards third parties. So uh, we have uh, a couple of API platforms. So the API gateways, the external one, the internal one, and enterprise service bus. And that's uh, what teams can use to offer APIs internally and externally. We have the developer portals internally and externally uh, so that uh, it's the one-stop shop where everybody can find the APIs or how to build those APIs. Uh, we have API competence center, developer relations, API tools, technical communications uh, to help teams to build proper APIs as well. And that's something that we have um, uh, created in the past couple of years. On the next slide, we are uh, showing that uh, APIs require uh, that business mindset and uh, looking into uh, the, uh, the next couple of years, I foresee that more and more APIs also internally become uh, micro products uh, and uh, where we now have dedicated product owners on our open APIs, more and more of them will also be a, have become a uh, way of thinking internally as well, uh, where product owners, business developers uh, are working together with the architects and engineers um, yeah, in a joint way. Now on the last slide, I present that this is a lengthy journey. So uh, we started that journey in 2015 uh, and on both the open APIs and the API, uh, enterprise APIs. Uh, yeah, it, it shows that building those platforms, building the developer portals, building the first open APIs and getting that journey along is a lengthy uh, uh, yeah, journey, but a fun one uh, to, to be uh, on as well. Um, yeah, in the last slides, we are on our way. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, you can click one, uh, one more ahead. So we are on our way, and I hope that you are uh, too as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Kun. Uh, thank you. We, had, we had actually one question about like how long it takes to be mature on the API journey, uh, but your the timeline you showed like it takes like uh, whatever. It, do you say it takes eight years, or after a few years you can? Or do you consider yourself mature? Uh, yeah, that's that is a uh, interesting question. Uh, um, it's always like a marathon runner, right? Uh, if you think that you're a major, you can go faster. And if uh, so, there's always a next level. So I always have compared it to uh, running marathons and each time it is deciding, do I want to uh, be on a journey for another iteration or am I now going to do a triathlon uh, because I can combine uh, multiple sports, etc. And I've, I look at the API journey in a similar way each time that you think that you are there, then now chat uh, GPT is uh, suddenly on the market and it requires different kind of mechanisms uh, on your API culture as well. So yes, we are mature compared to a couple of other industries, but are we there where we should be? Uh, I don't know, I, I cannot answer that. Yeah, thank you very much, Good. And again, thank you for being there to present like the, the private sector aspect, you know, the banking aspect, but to help public sector to open APIs and get the right maturity. Thank you, Ken, and see you at next uh, next event. Thank you very much for Thank being you. with us. All right. And, and, and we continue, but now so we, we finish to talk about the private sector and we will dive into the public sector with Jari Rainey uh, from the National Land Survey of, of Finland, uh, who will tell us about providing habit that I said through APIs. Hello, Jari, how are you? Hello, thank you, Mehdi. Uh, all good here. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm really happy to share my thoughts about how to provide high value data sets uh, through APIs. I've been working in geospatial standardization for a bit more than 10 years already, and also quite involved in, in different EU initiatives and directives like Inspire, as well as uh, Open Data Directive and its uh, implementing act called High Value Datasets. 
So I will first start a little bit of background how geospatial industry has developed different kind of APIs and then looking into the future and how we can utilize these APIs to, to implement high value data sets. Of course, as even if we have a lot of maps available and you can see even from my video on my back, there is a map from Finland. It's a paper map, but obviously we deliver a lot of data through different kind of APIs. And even already 20 years ago, uh, Open Geospatial Consortium, OGC, developed uh, several different standards uh, to, to deliver either map images or the actual features or kind of buildings and the information, how many floors you have in the buildings. And those were pretty much uh, using uh, SOAP or visible communication and had a lot of XML. But now we are moving more into the open API related world. So OGC and W3C, World Wide Web Consortium, made a, made a project called Spatial Data on the Web. It's still publicly available at the W3C website. And it actually had an outcome of several different uh, ideas how to move forward. And based on that, uh, OGC started to work on so-called OGC APIs. So these are really resource-centric RESTful APIs with, with very modern web development practices. And obviously developers love these kind of, of uh, APIs. Uh, those standards are really uh, as a building blocks. So you don't need to implement everything what is stated in the standard. So based on your use case, you pick up those building blo blocks which are required. Those are quite easy to implement, easy to consume. So in, in kind of mainstream IT, you are using a lot of RESTful APIs and as well as uh, open API specification. So these OTC APIs are also uh, based on open API. Uh, it's just a new rebranding or renaming as these OTC is, is working on these. And some of these standards are also uh published as uh, iso standards so as a global global uh, standardization organization so when we, we we started to work with these ogc apis we of course have several different of them with the green border you can see some of them which are, are really uh, already approved and in use so this so-called OTC API features where you can deliver points and lines and polygons. Spatial is not special, but it, it has some differences compared to many other domains that we have a lot of coordinates and things like that. And these OTC API features can deliver that geospatial content for machine to machine reading or to, to web or, or mobile applications. Then we have so-called OTC API processes, which can then also be used for, for making different kind of calculations. Then we have uh, coverage data. Then we are using OTC API coverage. So it's multidimensional uh, data and also so-called environmental data retrieval uh, in which we have more like a meteorological information. And, and all these which are now rounded in, in red are, are to be most likely to be used in high value data sets uh, implementation. And then there are several others like OGC API maps, which can deliver maps. You can have styles, you can have routing from point A to B, etc., etc. But if we dive a little bit more into the details of, of, of different uh, uh, APIs uh, we can we can use so OTC API features I already mentioned and it can be used to to deliver geospatial content and it's used as a download service in Inspire and Directive OTC API maps it can deliver maps and then very important is OTC API records so it's it's the capability of look into metadata so how you can search how you can find your data sets there are billions of data sets av available 
in, in, in the world, so you must find them somehow. And this discovery service, you can find uh, metadata through that API. And all of them are based on open API specification with some enhancements and with some additions there. But you can use Wacker and everything like in, in other open API implementations. Then we have processes, coverage is EDR, so also to download a bit more into the content and all of them can be used also in the implementation of, of high value data sets. If we dive a bit more into OGC API features, it is a multi-part standard. So currently we have part one and two. So you, you can have the content, but then you can have content in different coordinate reference systems. So there are in, in individual countries, you may have local coordinate reference systems. So this standard will, will support those activities. Data is usually delivered as a geo-JSON. So it's normal JSON, but it has a location component inside it. So it includes uh, some, some coordinates or of course through web browsers via HTML, but you may have also different other encodings. Here I'm mentioning so-called GeoPackage, which is actually SQLite database, but it, it also has an extension of Geospace, so it can understand these points and lines and uh, 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 polygons. And there are several commercial and open source software available either to implement this uh, API or to consume uh, API. So that's uh, really, really a stable uh, uh, standard and, and quite widely used already. And just to cite mentioning that it's approved as a so-called inspired good practice. So if, if you are working on inspire directive, you can use this open API based OGC API features in your download services. And I really support and, and recommend of, of using this also in high value data sets. If you just look a little bit into how it may look like, so on the left hand side, you have this tier JSON, you have links and you have properties, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is from the Netherlands the data in this particular case. And then on the right hand side, you have an HTML representation of that. So pretty much the similar information. And with these APIs, you can query in different ways. You can set up so-called bounding box. So you can define the area of interest. You, you would like to get your data and then it will give you geotation back or HTML. The next one is OGC API processes. Just as an example that, for instance, we can calculate uh, 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 from a 2D flat building, a 3D building. So if, if you have an ID of your country and then you have ID of the individual building, then we will calculate based on digital terrain model and digital surface model. We can calculate the average height of the building and we can generate on the fly these kind of 3D buildings. And on the left, you see how the structure, it has a landing page, it has API definitions in JSON or YAML, includes conformance classes, and then the, the most important is the input and output things, uh, what are shown on the, on the right-hand side. And here you can see a little bit of, of example, those reddish uh, buildings are actually pure 3D data, but these uh, uh, blue ones from Madrid and from Helsinki are actually generated on the fly uh, the way I just uh, previously uh, mentioned. So what, what we could do with this OGC API processes, uh, uh, it, it could be used, for instance, for bulk download. So as, as uh, Alexander Kotsev from, from JRC gave a presentation in the beginning of the workshop that uh, we have different APIs, but when relevant, we may also have this bulk download when you uh, download everything. So in, in this case, we could use these API features. There's uh, older OGC WFS and then these OGC API processes, or you may have a 
well, atom feeds, which is not really an API, but it, you can then just click on the links and you get the whole data set back to your, your machine. But if you are thinking about the download, here is a user interface where I draw an area of interest on the left hand side on the map. I would like to get a, a topographic map database uh, to my computer. And then I can select a format. In, in this case, it's a geo package. And then I can download it. This is the user interface. But of course, behind the scenes, there is an API. And in this case, it's OTC API processes. So the user will send a request to the API. API then will go to the workers. Workers are those who are actually getting the pure content from uh, National Land Survey of Finland databases. We have several different databases. They will dive and dig into the database, take the content, and then finally, it will be delivered through API to the, to the end user on the, on the right hand side. So this is one possible way of, of implementing a download service through API. So if we then go into these European data spaces, uh, Green Deal is the most important fun, uh, one for, for our National Land Survey, as we have most of the content for that area. But of course, mobility, agriculture, and many others also require geospatial information. And these uh, standards or APIs are a really good way of being as a fuel to high value data sets and then to uh, uh, data spaces. And if we are just really quickly look into what kind of implementation possibilities you have. So we are currently under the Inspire directive. So we already have several of different APIs available, but here is just a brief table how to how you can integrate uh, high value data sets with you can use. So the atom feed is only maybe which cannot be used as an API, but it can be used uh, uh, as a bulk download. And finally, before we, we will uh, stop, uh, how to implement high value data sets. A lot of uh, software is available, either commercial or open source. On left hand side, you can pick up your interesting uh, API standard to be used, which is really for your use cases. Then you select uh, data endo encoding. What is the format you will deliver your data? So here I have GeoJSON, and then there is going to be a new standard called JSON features and geometries, which also includes a more coordinate reference and schema support. You can deliver geo package, or you can deliver, deliver uh, through GML geography markup language which is also currently used uh, a lot in Inspire directly, directive. So I believe uh, this actually concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Jari. Thank you very much. Um, uh, would you say, we had just one question. Would you say that respecting standards helps for uh, developer adoption of APIs? Absolutely. That's that's really a crucial point as, as when those are standardized, all the APIs can work together in more more performant way. So it's it's really important. Open API itself, open API specification, it gives you a lot of flexibility. But in, in different domains, it's important to standardize to make some kind of guidelines how to move forward. Not to be too tight, but still some ideas how to move forward and especially these OTC APIs are the, the, the work on behalf of geospatial community. There are other domains. We had a presentation from banking just uh, before me. They have own ways of doing, but some standards are obviously uh, needed. Thank you very much, Jari. You were, uh, we're catching up on time, but uh, thank you very much for this presentation again. Uh, uh, for explaining what you were doing on the National Land Survey for Finland. And our next speaker will be Marco Panebianco, Chief of Data Architecture and Digital Ecosystem Unit at ARIA. And so, Marco, uh, you will tell us about like API driven regional ecosystems. So, the stage is yours, Marco.
Okay, thank you, Mehdi. Good morning to all of you. Um, I am work in Aria, which is the uh, in-house company of Region Lombardy, dealing with uh, innovation and uh, public procurement. Uh, so, um, I, actually, I oversee uh, some challenging projects on data governance and uh, data valori valorization. And uh, it's, uh, I'm here to, to share with you on behalf of Region Lombardy uh, what we are doing and what we are planning to do in the next future about uh, digital ecosystems and data valorization in general. Uh, Lombardy, as, as you probably know, is one of the main regions uh, in, uh, in Italy and uh, it's quite complex, but uh, uh, we have a lot of opportunities to share a value. This is my agenda. I will go through the, uh, the topics right now. So um, someone says that data is the new oil. But uh, in a way, I consider, I prefer to consider data as a renewable resource because, in fact, we, we can take it, extract it from the systems, from where they are managed. We can uh, work on that. We can let uh, someone access and, sh and uh, use uh, those data to create, create uh, a sort of information energy, I mean. Uh, so this data can be used many times without running out. So we have, uh, in this way, they can be considered renewable, renewable sorry, <laughs> uh, and uh, create uh, public value. And the, the, the problem is how and in, in which ways uh, we could, uh, as a public administration, uh, generate uh, the opportunities of value for other ones, and not for only only for the public administration itself. So uh, here I summarize a, a simple formula. Uh, in our experience, these are the three main uh, elements or variables that uh, uh, impact on data value. The first one is fairness. Uh, at the beginning of this workshop, uh, one of the speakers told about fairness. And uh, we do believe that fairness is uh, the, the way, the way to share, to let the data value maybe uh, can, can be used from a different point of views and by many users from different for different usages and use cases but uh, there are uh, other uh, elements that are to be considered one of course is quality because without quality it's difficult to generate a value and the third valuable is people without people without the relationships among people in our experience, it's quite difficult to generate something good. So this formula uh, for us is could be applied to all data, but especially to the so-called high-value data, because they uh, could generate more and more, more value uh, on different uh, use case scenarios. In a way, the FAIR approach extends uh, even the open data approach because uh, uh, as uh, I, I, I will show in the next few minutes, uh, uh, we can uh, um, share data in a lot of ways uh, with the uh, different poli policies. Uh, so uh, they can be used uh, for business and scientific research, uh, uh, even uh, with some limitations of some uh, constraints, but uh, fitting to the uh, use case itself and not uh, only giving data for a, 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 a wide user uh, without policies. The Region Lombardy approach to value data is uh, quite, uh, um, quite uh, wide because uh, starting from the base, this uh, Region Lombardy data assets, uh, we have now uh, five ways to share the data. Uh, they are different uh, among, among them, uh, but uh, they are different because we have different targets. And so we can 
give one, um, one only solution for all the needs. And so these uh, five uh, channels, in a way, are uh, representative of different models uh, of relationships uh, or different uh, towards different targets. To the left side, you can see the open uh, offer of data through APIs. And this is the uh, offer uh, delivered by the GeoPortal of Lombardy and by the Open Data um, Initiative of Region Lombardy. They are complementary. Uh, the GeoPortal is uh, the way uh, and the, the place where you can find all the geographic information in open data, all the other ones, but they are connected in a way. And then uh, moving to the left, uh, to the right side of the slide, we have uh, even other ways to share data and APIs. And they are even um, powered by APIs. But uh, in these cases, in E015 Digital Ecosystem and API Lombardy, uh, there is the need for formal relationships. Um, and so um, formal relationships or contracts uh, can uh, include uh, uh, different policies and not only open data for all or for every, for, um, every uh, usage. Uh, the fifth one on the right side is an initiative uh, devoted to universities and public and private research centers that deals with the uh, access to uh, data that can be uh, used uh, by anyone, especially in the healthcare domain, and uh, only for uh, research uh, goals. But uh, to deliver this, uh, all of these assets, uh, we have to, to start uh, a, a governance uh, uh, initiative, a, a, a sum of governance initiatives that start with an enterprise architecture to have a, a representation of all the services we are delivering, the information and data governance initiative to understand the data, and the API governance to understand uh, uh, which of the data could be del delivered through APIs as a product. But uh, I, I will take uh, focus uh, only on this one because there are only a few minutes to, to, to talk about. Uh, about Open Data Lombardia uh, is the main initiative uh, on open data in, in Lombardy, is one of the main in, in Italy. And uh, we have uh, the participation of uh, other subjects, not only region, but even other regional comp companies and more than uh, 120 municipalities in Lombardy. This is the link, but I don't want to go through the, the numbers, not too much, but just only focusing on this data, on this number, because uh, uh, on the latest year, uh, we had uh, uh, more than um, 56 million API calls to our platform. And this is, is, a, is a huge number, but it's a huge number, number with respect to the previous years, and uh, mainly focused, focused on uh, uh, data about environment and healthcare. And this is a, a quite uh, a good indicator of how is changing the way of accessing to the data from the target users. Not only take a look, uh, download, uh, but is I want to make an application. I want to, to interoperate. Uh, <clears throat> I present here some uh, use cases. Uh, I, I, I talk about known use cases, but in, in effort, uh, in open data, we don't have a, a contract, so we, we don't know who is on the other side, <laughs> uh, who is the, the end user or the, uh, the, the subject that is using the data. But uh, we have a lot of uh, ways to understand uh, or to detect uh, the use cases, and they are principally mainly in the uh, field of data analysis, uh, making apps, uh, making some social collaboration on data, and uh, a lot of data journalism uh, use cases. 
The other initiative is E015 Digital Ecosystem, which uh, was born in uh, 2015 uh, when the Milan, uh, Milan um, Expo uh, event. And uh, it was at the time a sort of, a sort of experiment of relationships be between and among a lot of uh, subjects. And uh, it uh, grew a lot in the latest, latest years. And now um, we have uh, uh, in this ecosystem more than 600 uh, subjects, actors, private and public that uh, work uh, together to make uh, uh, apps through APIs. The paradigm is that uh, every subject is, that is uh, in, in, uh, participated to this uh, ecosystem can publish an API or can consume an API, making uh, its own usage uh, through an app. And, uh, in this way, uh, they establish a sort of digital relationships. Now we have uh, more than 550 digital relationships active. This, I don't want to go into the offer, but I want to share with you some uh, interesting use cases. For example, here is a tourism use case, uh, which a lot of uh, subjects in the ecosystem publish their own uh, events. It deals with the events on tourism or culture. And then uh, another subject uh, takes uh, all of these uh, events uh, by using uh, APIs uh, and publish them in a, in a unique portal uh, for uh, citizens. But uh, not only the portal, the subject that aggregates the offer also republish an API in the inside the digital ecosystem for usage uh, by other uh, subjects and other possible use cases. So uh, we have a, a place uh, that contains all the local events uh, and can be shared uh, not only in the regional uh, uh, portal, that is this one, but even used by other subjects for their uh, goals. Another example is about environmental use case. Is that we have uh, the sensor data from the environmental, environmental agency of Region Lombardy, which are uh, exposed by APIs. And uh, here we have um, a dam manager, a, a dam uh, company that uh, uses real time weather data to monitor uh, and uh, mix up the data with the data of them in a sort of management then management system and even we have a, another uh, th these are only samples so we have a lot of use cases but details these are uh, the main, main interesting to me um, a civil protection use case with uh, region lombardy publish an api uh, with the civil protection alerts and then a lot of other subjects uh, integrate this information in their uh, end user apps or web uh, sites. But uh, uh, general, um, we can generalize the concept uh, um, in a sort of uh, public value chain because uh, uh, in the latest uh, years, uh, we, we had a lot of uh, uh, ICT companies in Lombardy uh, that uh, make business in a way uh, using the data from E015 and from open data altogether to generate, uh, to create apps and web websites uh, um, for uh, Lombard municipalities. The, the flow is, uh, is this, uh, these are the data, Start, we are starting from, uh, they are data about um, uh, daily life, in a way, uh, something that is interesting for citizens to know, for quali air quality, um, emergency rescue status, uh, or uh, uh, 
for example, uh, the, um, ele the electric charge uh, units uh, and uh, sensor data, uh, meteo data, uh, alerting about civil protection. All of these data are integrated by ICT companies, uh, almost 10, uh, in their solutions that they sell to the municipalities. Of, it's uh, their business, of course. And uh, uh, these municipalities uh, um, uh, let uh, this solution available, available for citizens. So the chain uh, that is, uh, is going on um, is fed by the data from the digital ecosystems and the open digital ecosystem and generate a value to the end users. That's potentially are more than 3 million on uh, 10 million of uh, Lombardy inhabitants. I mean, this is a, a, a good example to me of what uh, a, um, an ecosystem could, um, could do could for uh, the, end, the end user benefit, uh, giving a, a vantage to all of the actors hmm? who publish and, and uh, who uh, is using the APIs. Uh, just going to the end, uh, um, we have uh, a plan to uh, put all, all initiatives all together uh, because uh, we have to uh, give a, a, an overall uh, uh, access to the digital ecosystems and give uh, better ways for the target users to understand where to find where to find, not only in the single uh, portals or initiatives. So the, the vision is to put all of these initiatives together because they cover a lot of targets. And uh, at the end, uh, we, have, um, uh, we aim uh, to uh, reach the goal, which is a political goal, uh, to have uh, Lombardy 2030 as a smart region and the smart and data-driven region. And in this way, we had a good news in the recent uh, months because uh, in February we had a, a new election, uh, regional election, and um, the new legislature uh, of the region has uh, stated that the regional development program for the next five years uh, must be sustainable and data-driven. And this is a, 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 great, uh, a great news because it's the first time that data-driven as a term, as a, a, the words data-driven uh, are in, uh, in a political uh, paper, in a political program. And so we, we think that the, this, uh, this political, new political approach to data could uh, help us to leverage the data culture and the data awareness inside the institution and uh, in the ecosystem we are presented right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Marco, for, for this. It's a great sign that the word data driven is now in the policy. Um, uh, so, um, uh, yes, we there's no direct questions, uh, but maybe uh, they will come and, uh, and you can stay in the chat to, ans to answer them. Thank you very much, Marco, okay. for being with us and sharing what Thank you're you. doing there. We nice. will continue. Thank you very much, very much. We will continue with Frederic Passanti, uh, Passaniti, right, from Open Data Soft, uh, who have a company who, have, who is helping uh, people to get open data into open APIs. And yes, Frederic, sorry for uh, the, the schedule, but uh, oh, Fred is not there yet. So we will go with Ina. Uh, we will go with uh, 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 with Ina De Visser about API strategy for high value data sets in the Netherlands. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am uh, Ina De from TU uh, What I would like to do you is in the next few minutes is to give you a perspective on how to deal with the changing environment of the European data ecosystem which is taking shape all around us, including through the high-value data sets that are made available through APIs. That change will be reflected in the European internal market for data, also known as the European data space. Uh, 
In fact, we have been building on European data space for years. We don't have to start from scratch now. Inspire not only gives us data and services, but also joint the developed architecture and standards. For those who are not familiar with Inspire, Inspire is an environmental directive and uh, requires all member states, all governmental levels in the member states to provide uh, on 34 themes uh, environmental data. If we look at the relationship between Inspire and high value data, then we see that 25 of the 34 Inspire themes fall under high value data. This makes Inspire an important open data source for the European data space. The high value objectives are additional on the Inspire objectives. They regulate what has not now not been or now been less well agreed under Inspire. Today, we will focus on the new additional API requirements resulting from the implementing regulation on high value. Uh, what we have done, uh, we have created a fact sheet, for, a fact sheet for Inspire data providers. You see the link at the lower level of the sheet uh, where we explain how Inspire services also meet the high value data requirements and also explain which Inspire network services act as an AP as uh, defined by the high value data. In addition, we also provide advice on which implementation best suits European and technical developments. Um, the advice in short, data sets accessed via Inspire Direct Access Download services can also be used as high value data APIs. It's more or less the same Yari uh, shows in his table before. There are no prescribed technical implementation rules from Open Data Directive or High Value Data Implementing Regulation, but there is an expect expectation that APIs will grow with the reasonable wishes of reusers. Therefore, we advise to implement and encourage the use of REST APIs in accordance with the Dutch AP strategy and in accordance with OTA AP standards, such as OTG AP features. The OTG AP features can also meet the Inspire download requirements as is described in the Inspire good practice. But we have a problem. We can give that advice, but the tools to serve space data via OTA AP features does not fully comply with the standards. Each tool requires an adjustment to a certain part. So we have launched an open tender with the objective to improve the tooling to serve space data via OGA AP features in the Netherlands and Europe according to the standards. Uh, the OTG standards for OTG AP features, part one and part two, um, the endorsed um, good practice for setting up an inspiring download service based on OTA IP features and also the, the uh, AP design rules, but it's not relevant uh, for Europe, only in the Netherlands. Why did we do this? Do from wants to strengthen the Dutch public ge geospatial infrastructure, infrastructure by making the public geospatial data better accessible, also outside of the geo domain. He wants to help inspire and high value data data providers to fill their duties and supporting the European development developments like the European data space. And also improving interoperability by stimulating the use of standards. We had some uh, requirements for the adjustment. The tool should be uh, a well-maintained tool and an open source tool with a solid community and to must have also an expect users in the Netherlands and also in Europe. We, we kept several offers and couldn't choose which tool we found most relevant, so we gave those three an assignment. 
uh, tier server and the Cree and PyTier AP, this uh, behind is the parties who work on those tools. In general, the following adjustments have been made. Supporting more than one coordinate system, and it's uh, part two of the uh, OTA AP feature standard. Uh, and CIRS is, is also confronted inspired URI uh, and not only a number. Um, also, adjust functionality to support required links, like the link to metadata, like link to encoding to end the feature concept. And also uh, add optional functionality to comply with Dutch API requirements. Uh, I'm not showing all results. We picked from the different tools some issues and results. This is the degree uh, implementation. Here you see that there are uh, several um, coordinate systems are supported. Below the map of the Netherlands, you see the three coordinate systems supported. So, um, and we, uh, the fix is all brought back to the main product. And that's not only for the Cree, but also for all the other tools that uh, it's not a uh, separate branch, but also all things are going to the main branch. So everybody is able to use the adjusted tools. Um, uh, for the tools, there is uh, they are have documented um, their adjustments, like here shown for uh, PyTier AP uh, about the coordinate reference system support. But other part of the result is that. Uh, uh, the organizations can also with um, things that are not going very well in um, validators. So uh, we have some uh, feedback, like on the side test, uh, which give clear messages. And beside that, we have also some recommendations to adjust the Inspire validator. As a result, all three uh, tool producers now APIs confirm the standards I mentioned before. So that was our main result. And what you very, like, you can show them on map, but what's most important is that you can use all those tools. You can try them, uh, those links, and uh, use them. Um, but uh, the most important part is uh, that everybody can use now um, the open source tooling to unlock, unlock your own data conforming the standards via an API. If you are interested in the results of this um, uh, of this exercise, we have had a uh, presentation yesterday, unfortunately, but I have included links so you can see the recording of this uh, results. Um, so we can now contribute to the European data ecosystem with those uh, APIs confirm all those standards. Inspire and high value data are an important open data source for European data space. You saw and see here a uh, mapping of the Inspire on the commonly mentioned art architecture components of a data space setup. Green are the Inspire uh, components already covered. Gray are aspects not covered on this moment. With adjusting the tools to share spatial data via OTA AP features, we use the foundation laid by Inspire and modernize it according to the new user needs so that geospatial data can be made better accessible, also out of geo domain. It's up to all of us to set the next step to provide the data in more accessible APIs and make them available in the European data space. Thank you.
for that. So a quick question about who has been the main sponsor of this initiative? Uh, we have done it. We sponsored those the three um, companies. No, no, we, we want to say we like uh, the executive, like which which decision maker like has been fully supporting uh, it or on what budget it was, uh, uh, you know, like uh, this is the question we have. Uh, it's uh, mainly based on um, um, uh, the Ministry of Interior. Okay, so it's really policy to uh, policy driven right here. Uh, it's policy driven and we support them and advise them and that's why they support it, yes. Yes, there is another question about like how uh, how in the future will you estimate return and investment on this initiative for public citizens? If you have any idea. Um, uh, difficult question. Yes, <laughs> yes uh, I don't know how fast it will be uh, return on investment, but I think so we uh, support the whole community and uh, uh, Sometime we will see it back, but I'm not sure when we have a return on those investments. We have a last question. Like, all, does this data is 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 free? Uh, the, the the tooling is free. It's open source tooling, so uh, all the adjustments are, um, uh, are brought back to the main branch. Uh, not yet uh, for all on this moment, but it will be done in a few months. Uh, depending on how uh, fast they can uh, uh, make decisions in the open source community to uh, accept those adjustments. Yes, I think we have a, we're all good for the three questions we had. Thank you very much, Ina. Thank you very much for this presentation. And if you can share us again the link, uh, right, we will send it back to all the attendees uh, of, of the webinar. Yes, okay. Thank sure. you very much, Ina. And now back, uh, sorry for the confusion, but Frédéric will be there to, to, to talk, uh, uh, um, to make his talk. So hi, Frédéric, sorry for Hello. Uh, Hello. the confusion, but yes, you're with us. You can show your slides about APIs at the service of you. It's a great title. Let's go for yeah. 15 minutes. Thank you very much. My name is Frédéric. I'm a solution architect at uh, Open Datasoft. So I will talk about uh, data experiences uh, made possible um, thanks to APIs, and I uh, will try to show you illustrate how apis are the the core engine for extracting the the value of your data and, and creating new services so um let's go in two parts this is the first one i will introduce uh, open data soft what we what we do uh, what we propose to our customers and uh secondly i will um, deep dive into a few data experiences made by uh, our customers Okay, so let's go. Um, open data soft, the data democratization uh, platform. So we are um, a 10 plus years uh, old uh, company. Uh, we are providing a SaaS uh, platform. Uh, we, uh, the idea is to allow our customers to, to share their data easily and create uh, data experience on top of it. So we are present in um, 25 countries. Uh, we open more than 500 platforms, so split almost equally between um, open data uh, portals and uh, private uh, data portals. It's a 50-50. Uh, our value proposition is to democratize the access of the data. So the idea is to let our customers be able to, to pull the data out of their internal storages and uh, expose them and share them um, to create uh, value out of it. So to do so, there is it's um, three main axes. So on the left, um, the um, open uh, data uh, portal, open data initiatives. Uh, the idea, like you know, of course, it's to reach to reach uh, the widest uh, audience as uh, possible. So to share the data to your citizens, journalists, or even companies uh, to develop um, innovative uh, services. In the, in the middle, the second one is um, uh, internal portal, so inside your organization uh, to create a, a self-service data portal. Uh, you will centralize the access of any kind of uh, data uh, valuable to your to your projects. And uh, the third one is um, the idea is to create a data marketplace to, to share and resell the data to your partners or to your customers. So multiple ways multiple uh, usages, but the common point among them is the capacity to generate APIs 
on your data to fuel your application and, uh, and your usages. So um, that's why we uh, are uh, an API first platform. So it's not uh, the first time this morning that you will hear about uh, this, uh, this term. Uh, API first, what it means? It means that as soon as you will push and publish data on the platform, it will automatically uh, generate APIs, uh, APIs for the catalog to be able to, to search and find data sets, but and of course uh, on data sets directly. So state of the art APIs that allows you to, to search, to filter, to compute uh, aggregation on your numerical data, to power uh, KPIs, uh, make some analysis through charts, etc. Uh, you must also be able to, uh, to download the data fully or partially. Uh, through very common and uh, easy to reuse uh, formats like CSV, Excel, JSON, if you have a geographical information, uh, also through shapefiles, KML, GeoJSON, etc. Um, okay, so let's go to some examples and data experiences from uh, our customers. Um, I will share mainly two from two cities, so Strasbourg in the east of France, and secondly, uh, Marseille in the south. Um, let's go. The first one is uh, Stras app, so the mobile application of the of the city. Um, several services, uh, and a lot of them uh, fed by their uh, open data portal. So the first one, the main one, is uh, is the map. Uh, it allows you to be geolocated and to see around you a uh, point of interest. So you will be able to select the, the citizens, the users will be able to select among a wide list of uh, layers of data and uh, display the point of interest around you on the map. Uh, the second one is the agenda uh, to see all the events organized by the city. Uh, you will be able to be notified also, for example, when you when the air uh, pollution, when the, the air quality uh, go among a specific uh, threshold, for example, or when it's time to uh, to put your garbage uh, in the street for collection, um, and also uh, transportation data, so real time data like bus position, pool attendance, if it's crowded or not, uh, etc. So uh, all of this. Uh, very citizen-oriented uh, usages are possible uh, thanks to the, the APIs that can uh, let the, the mobile application uh, get and, and consume the data directly. The, the second one, also uh, related to uh, the, the map display, the, so it's um, the, the aim here is to propose an enriched experience uh, for city agents and public services to visualize, in fact, in three dimensions. Uh, the buildings, the roads, uh, public equipments directly from their, their office, so in their web browser. And uh, again, the idea is to add on top of uh, the, let's say, the, 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 the visualization uh, data and layers of, uh, of data. So here we can say that it's a bit uh, less citizen oriented, but more like um, a technical analysis tool for decision support, for example, or to conduct um, urbanism project uh, in the in the city. So you have the URL, so feel free to, to go and, uh, and have a look and, uh, and go in the city in three dimension. It's, uh, it's really, really nice. Um, the next one is uh, for ex uh, Marseille uh, cities, so ex Marseille Provence Metropolis in the south. Um, here it's interesting because it's um, it's uh, one data through uh, its API, but to perform multiple usages and especially uh, to reach different um, audiences. So the first one on the left is uh, let's say the data exploration. So you can go directly on the data catalog you will uh, access the data. It's more for uh, internal usages or data experts, let's say. So you could perform some analysis, uh, some statistics, and uh, see and chart, for example, by type of roads, uh, the reasons why the, the roads and tunnels are closed uh, in, the, in the city. And you will be able to see uh, the real-time status and the, and the planned uh, closure of the, of the tunnels in the, in the metropolis. The second one in the middle is um, on the mobile application. So you will have an uh, embedded view of, of the map. 
uh, again, a map, a map use case, so you will be able to, to, to see around you all the, um, the tunnels and, and road uh, uh, status. And the third one, the ones that uh, reach uh, the maximum of, uh, of persons, it's uh, through um, uh, a specification format de defined by, uh, by Google, calls uh, it, its name the uh, Closure and Incident Fit Specification. It's a, it's a specific API format that helps um, ways uh, trip planner application to consume directly the data and to use it uh, internally in its uh, system to optimize the, the, the trip planning. So the idea is uh, through the Ways for Cities uh, partnership. I don't know if you already heard about this uh, partnership. It's, um, it's a partnership between the city and Ways directly. They uh, agreed that uh, Ways is providing an API to let the city uh, consume and see in real time uh, it says to have an overview of their territory. So all the traffic jams, uh, the alerts uh, reported by uh, drivers, the irregularities on the, on the road networks, etc. And in exchange, the city uh, commit to, uh, to push and to provide all the information regarding the, the road uh, closures and the planification of uh, road works. So this of course, is only available uh, with uh, with uh, APIs to share the data automatically. So it's a really interesting uh, uh, usage. The um, the last one, um, it's it's a, let's say it's an internal project, not more for um, training and, and testing purposes. The idea was to for us we looked uh, for uh, real time uh, data on our uh, data hub. So we are we, are, we have a data hub. Uh, sharing all the open data, uh, open data sets of our customers. So if you go to data.opendatasets.com, you will find it. So we are looking for real-time data uh, to develop an application and see uh, see uh, uh, who it would be uh, uh, complicated or not to do. And uh, we thought, okay, uh, we we found this real-time data availability for parkings and said, okay, it's cool, it's it's really nice. But when you are driving, when you are in your car and you look for a parking, you won't take your, your mobile phone, you won't take your browser and uh, go to the, an open data portal and search for the data set and see uh, where it's free or not, etc. So the idea was really simple. We wanted to, to optimize the user experience on a very specific use case. And here, the idea was to reduce the time to access the data to its minimum. So uh, we developed this uh, minimalistic uh, app uh, directly uh, plugged onto uh, the API. And in fact, um, proposing an optimized uh, experience on a very specific data was uh, no more than two days of development of work. It was really quick because um, the API was there. It was available. We, could, we, we have been able to directly uh, go get the data. And the only one thing to do was to propose a nice look, of course, but also um, a list view, a map view, and uh, host it on a free service online, uh, online like uh, Vercel, Netlify, Amplify. We have, you have a tons of service nowadays to host this kind of um, web application. So, um, so to conclude, uh, what's Let's say that we are convinced, convinced in the self-service um, data, the idea that uh, you have the API, the data is here, is ready. Uh, we work for um, setting up an API that is uh, robust, reliable, uh, that can um, perform well uh, even when uh, there is a high peaks of, um, of uh, usages. So allowing your ecosystem uh, with uh, ready to use APIs and, uh, in, in, with a strong and secure backend where everyone will be able to come and plug in directly is, uh, is a real accelerator for innovation and uh, creating value out of uh, your, your data. Uh, thank you for your attention. I I try to be uh, to be quick. One, one comment here: um, Do you confirm all these cities, public sector, they have an open data strategy and and uh, and files available, and an open API strategy? Right? It's it's not one or the other; it's two in the same time, or not? Yeah, it's two in the same time. There are, there are uh, several uh, level, let's say, uh, of usage that they first have uh, the the mission to to open data as much as possible and then 
on top of it, secondly, once they have their data catalog and uh, the open data initiative is, uh, is, uh, has started, uh, they start to create innovative uh, services on top of it. And uh, uh, of course, it's a discussion with uh, reusers, with uh, consumers to improve uh, the services and to be uh, the most pertinent as possible. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Frederick. That was the question we had. Thank you very much. And again, Open Data Soft, like uh, you're helping hundreds of public sector uh, initiatives to uh, transform into APIs. So, yeah, thank you for sharing these elements. Have a good thank one, you. Frederick. And again, last but not least, speaker before panel will be Pinar Oskan. Uh, so, if you can have Pinar. So, Pinar was already speaker at another event. So, if she finally found a way to, to speak at this event. So, thank you very much, Pinar, uh, for being there. And uh, sorry for the delay, but yeah, you can be there. And yes, uh, you you uh, you will share with us uh, 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 the slides about your uh, pre presentation. There is a current issue uploading, but but yes. So your work is really about the economics uh, of platforms and the specialization, at least in in the banking banking sector, right? Yes, yes, I do. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation. I uh, literally stepped out of another fintech event here in London um, at the EY uh, headquarters and uh, happy to connect with you guys on this. Um, so um, the, the, the studies that I do are um, all within the fintech space looking at uh, the way that data and regulatory issues are shaping firm strategy and competition. And today I'm happy to share uh, some of the consequences of open banking regulation in terms of uh, competition, innovation, but also some of the unintended, unforeseen consequences in terms of the evolution of the financial industry. Um, there is a technical issue, so my slides will be shared from your slides. I think Fabian is working on that right now. Yeah, Fabian um, is working on that, but if we can try at least the intro part and stuff, we're yeah, solving that. Absolutely. Happy to do that. Yeah. Great. So um, uh, let me just, and in fact, I can um, um, go with, I don't even need the pre presentation. If the slides come up, uh, let them come up, but I'll, I'll just speak uh, without them for now. Um, so uh, basically, when we, uh, uh, when we looked at uh, the, the evolution of open banking, taking uh, the UK um, as a case study uh, of already five years ago and uh, tracing the evolution of the market over time, uh, we saw some very interesting things. Ah, thank you. Here they are. Um, if we can go into presentation mode, that would be fantastic. And already, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first question that we asked was, what, why does open banking matter? Uh, what is it that open banking brings to uh, the, uh, the market? And uh, moving on to the next slide, what we see is that um, open banking actually is one of the rare cases where innovation actually doesn't come before regulation, but regulation it comes before innovation and tries to open up the doors to innovation. Next slide, please. So in the uh, case of open banking, as many of you know, I don't have to explain this, uh, the, the, the idea is to give access uh, uh, to consumer data for third parties. And the reason why that matters is because with a, in a knowledge intensive industry, data intensive industry like finance, uh, innovation cannot happen without a, a, a access to data, and that means that third parties that are hoping to come in uh, cannot compete meaningfully, and that's why we've seen the uh, stagnation of the industry in the in the past few decades until uh, the fintech movement. Next slide, please. What we see in terms of uh, the 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 pro trajectory of open banking is that it's only the first step, as you know, um, in opening up markets and letting data be the main weapon for innovation and competition. So with open banking, we're thinking about payments and payment data. But then now already in the UK and in the EU and many other parts of the world, we're thinking about open finance, where the uh, idea is that all financial data will be subject to sharing, on consent and that is part of a larger movement uh, of open data where we think about not just financial data but uh, energy data and healthcare data etc uh, as may being meaningfully and securely shared uh, for uh, uh, boosting competition and innovation next slide please what we see also is that um, an intended consequence very much desired by regulators was that uh, customers benefit from this innovation when customers can give access to their data 
um, and uh, build consent into the process, what they will get from that is that they will be able to share uh, their data with those parties that can analyze and give them meaningful results and recommendations in terms of savings, investments, and again, a data analysis and um, machine learning and AI tools will be uh, more and more important as a, a way for customers to get more tailored uh, and more, um, let's say, more um, uh, insightful financial services, not just blanket services that are offered all at the same rate uh, to anyone. Next slide, please. Another th uh, cons intended consequence that we see is that those financial services that we all have observed and got experienced as a bundle uh, being offered by banks are near, now being unbundled. And so this is a busy slide, but if you look at the house in the middle and around it, it's actually an HSBC site. And this is just an example, of course, but for every uh, financial service that is being offered by HSBC, there is now a FinTech and even several FinTechs that are offering the same service or similar services, but better, faster, cheaper, potentially uh, through the use of technology. And that means that these services are being unbundled, but that also means that consumers now need to be made aware of all these innovations. And it is, of course, quite difficult for us to shop around for all these different services, which brings forward the idea of platformication of the financial services, where um, just like we shop for many different things from even food to uh, sanitary products on Amazon, uh, we can uh, uh, shop for different financial services on platforms that invite these fintechs and uh, offer their services to us and also do the vetting process. Next slide, please. What we have done recently, which is quite exciting, uh, and this is in fact uh, quite recent, it is uh, as of last month that this study is out and it's open access. So uh, if you Google it, or if you just Google my name and find my website, you'll be able to have access to this uh, uh, study, which we think is quite the way that it connects different movements in finance to one another. Next slide, please. What we have studied in this uh, research is that we have looked into the implementation, the rollout of the open banking uh, regulation in the UK. And what we found was that there, there were certain decisions and certain reactions from the market, which created some unintended consequences. And these unintended consequences aren't all bad. Some of them are actually great, but um, they have few different movements as we've seen. The first challenge is that as I've seen, as I've shown you before, open, uh, payment open um, uh, banking is just about payments data which means that if a fintech needs other types of data from a consumer it is now forced until open finance is uh, is uh, fully implemented uh, the fintech is forced to approach the customer in different uh, ways via different channels that's as if uh, you know as the same person calling me via mobile and then next minute via Zoom, and then next minute uh, via Teams, and uh, and also trying my house phone. It creates a confusion in the uh, consumer space. And what that means is that these newcomers that are uh, offering these innovative services are actually struggling to make themselves uh, perceived as trustworthy when what they have to do in order to access different kinds of data um, is basically creating confusion in the customer's uh, space. So the limited scope of the open banking uh, uh, regulation uh, being just to, about current or checking accounts and payment data created this uh, effect in, uh, in the consumer space. Uh, moving on. Thank you so much. And let's move on one more. Uh, what we have also seen is that there is a challenge, another challenge, which is uh, about the reactions of the market. So when uh, open banking was first implemented, banks naturally had a defensive view. And what we've seen is that some of the decisions of the regulators to uh, leave certain parts to the market to figure out, for example, strong customer authentication created an issue in that uh, something that uh, could have been done in a really seamless uh, way uh, was actually done both due to strategic uh, uh, lack of incentives or, or misaligned incentives, as well as technical competencies, it, it is it has been done in a way that um, that is very difficult for the consumer to experience open banking in a positive way. If you pay attention to the quote there on the right, what you'll see is that so this is from a regulator, and they're saying uh, what should have been done in two 
screens, like you know, to authenticate yourself as a customer, required 16 screens uh, at the beginning of open banking and 12 minutes for customers to try and uh, navigate their way through. Which means that some of these um, ways in which you know there's always the uh, idea in uh, in, in uh, market regulation that. If you let competition handle certain innovations, then it's better because it's uh, it, it's more agile. It changes with time. However, in this particular say, uh, case, we see that if you don't handhold some of the most defensive players uh, very tightly, then what they will come up with is probably going to be suboptimal, and this is going to experience the uh, adoption of the of the uh, regulation. Moving on, next slide. What we also see is that some of these connectivity bottlenecks that are created because the banks at the beginning have been on the defensive, not publishing APIs in a way that they should, not in a standards way, a standardized way, and also making it difficult for fintechs to access the data, both for competency as well as for strategic reasons, have created a bottleneck. What we found, though, was that the way that this bottleneck was resolved ended up creating a cross-industry phenomenon which has fueled uh, the embedded finance movement. Moving on to the next slide. So what we've seen is that as the technical bottleneck appeared between banks that were required to publish APIs and fintechs and the third parties that uh, wanted to access these APIs when that connection didn't work very well, there was a new type of industry role that was created, which you can see there in the middle, uh, API aggregators. This is an unintended consequence in that these connectivity uh, platforms or players shouldn't be needed in principle. But when they were needed and when they came into uh, the sector, to provide these seamless connections by standardizing, harmonizing data and uh, making open APIs work, then they emerged in a technical, uh, out of that technical necessity, but over time they started to grow strategically. And as they were the connectivity player, they started to offer this data to not just financial players like fintechs, but also players from other industries such as airlines and supermarkets and consultancy firms and you know insurance firms. And that what that means is that um, the uh, API aggregators were a very important element in the movement uh, uh, going towards embedded finance. Next slide, please. So overall, what we can see is that Open banking and the technical bottlenecks that were uh, uh, that emerged during the implementation of open banking made it possible for those players that were the handlers of data, the platforms that were providing uh, connectivity, to start to reach out to other industries and thereby blurring industry lines between finance and other industries by giving other players uh, from other industries an opportunity to offer financial services through these connectivity players. Um, an insurance player or a supermarket uh, may never have been interested in getting access to financial data. It is just if, uh, as a large and inertial firm, it would have never been within their scope to do so. But through these connectivity players that were basically pushing the data out of the financial system, uh, embedded finance really uh, prospered. So overall, what we see is that there were quite a few unintended consequences of the regulation. And this means uh, that uh, there is definitely more innovation, which was intended. There is more competition, which is intended. But perhaps in an unintended way, uh, there is also the blurring of industry uh, boundaries between finance and other industries, which makes the jobs of regulators particularly interesting today. I believe this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, open to uh, questions and discussion now. Thank you for aggregators. So now we have a lot of public sector companies who are uh, who are incentivized and obliged to open high value data sets like like banking data could have been. Uh, so uh, yeah, how these new aggregators like have been uh, able to take let's say this the the disintermediation between the original institution and the market. Uh, sorry, the, uh, was that the uh, question no, that uh, how, how these. Can you how the aggregators part, have been able, how the aggregators have been able to take over the relationship between mm -hmm. the banks and the market? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, it was a technical issue. It was because banks were did not know how to open properly APIs. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So I think, in fact, you're 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 saying it exactly right. 
what could have been something that banks uh, could do if they were thinking about their data more strategically from day one, ended up being done by connectivity players, API aggregators, uh, by leveraging bank data through this regulation, which of course we also need to think about how this affects the big tech movement into different sectors, right? So what does this mean for for uh, big tech when uh, all these uh, connectivity platforms already exist for them to plug in financial data and how will they uh, oligopolistic uh, uh, power in markets change? This is also an interesting conversation, perhaps for another day. Yeah, uh, that was the question we had. Thank you very much, Pinar, for your presentation and for the conditions of the presentations. Thank but, you so uh, much. Yeah, we'll, of course, we will invite you to our other events. And now we, have, we still have 20 minutes for the panel we have we had to answer all the questions i will ask the speakers who who uh, who finally uh, were able to do to do it so uh, mark bud alexander ervold uh, maybe marco panidianko uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, monica yeah and others uh, so the, the the speakers who were still uh, there to uh, to answer the questions uh, and the goal is really about like um, uh, how the, the, the theme is really the, the, what would be the first step for an API strategy for opening highly value data sets. So that was really the main question. So um, uh, is there any one of you who wants to start about this, this question? I'll Mark, go then. Okay. Um, uh, and it sounds like Alexander is ready after me. So the, uh, So I would say find who is doing this at the European Commission level and who is doing this as your peer in another country because you want to be able to be drawing on um, the uh, on using a common data model and common standards so that we overcome what Pinar pointed out in open banking was the challenge where you've got this diversity of standards and a diversity of high value data sets you're not going to get the innovation from developers if they need to change or re-understand what is, what a high value data set is being how how the um uh, field names or how the caller reference in one country is different to another country when they're both dealing with geographic data or meteorological data or so on so that would be my first step is find your peers and find the network find the data space that's covering that issue and make sure that you're working together and that the communication's open there that's my thoughts so alexander had his hand up too Thank you, uh, uh, Mark. Uh, the first thing to mention, I couldn't agree more with that. I think uh, it's a uh, look around, learn from the others. Uh, there is so much inspiration also in this workshop today. We saw so many sophisticated use cases. I think that the, the, the financial and the banking sector is really advanced because the process has started maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, so th there is a lot of inspiration that can be drawn from those examples. The other thing just to, to, to mention, uh, which also came very clear from several of the presentations today, is that it's a process. Deploying an API is not the end of the story, it's probably the beginning of a process. I think it was Cohen who, who mentioned it, it's a marathon. It might be a triathlon, it might be an ultra marathon, I don't know, but it's important to start and to really see it with the lens of a process, uh, in my view, and a process that should be inclusive and that we can all help each other to learn from the good practices and also learn uh, what uh, to avoid. Also, I have one point just to compare uh, some of the public sector and banks are not the same, but they can have some similarities. So um, in, in the banking sector, it has been caused by regulation. There are really, really few banks who open the APIs you know, publicly before the regulation. They were having great changing data, but not in a way that was so open, so self-service. So do you think in the public sector, we will have, let's say, ex uh, public institutions will go beyond regulation? So I know that some cities and uh, and some countries have been really uh, uh, proactive on this, but do you think the large majority will just follow the regulation? Marco or Ine, for example, as you are part of this public sector institution. Yes, as I think the majority of the member states will only follow the required part, but in the Netherlands we try to do something more and stimulate our uh, data providers to do a little bit more and see also the connections with other um, 
developments so that uh, we, we, we look at a higher level uh, what should be developed and I think that will help and just doing uh, some a little bit more will help us in future to be uh, make it easier to provide data. Marco, you want to jump in? We can't hear you. You're on mute, Marco. I, I don't know. Still on mute. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I perfectly agree with Mark uh, Boyd uh, with the need uh, of a standard regulation, even if it's quite difficult for a public administration to get this, this result if there is not a, a great commitment from the top, uh, from the top uh, in the hierarchy level, the European, national, regional. We are a region, so we have to uh, follow this, uh, this chain in a way. And another thing is that it's quite difficult because uh, data um, are generated, created by administrative processes inside the uh, region, for example. So uh, you have to pay the, the gap uh, uh, between uh, the administrative goals uh, and the business goals. So we have a lot of data that uh, could be very useful, but to be very, very uh, useful to business, they have to be enriched. So our goal is to enrich the administrative data with uh, uh, other sources to get very usable uh, data for the business, for the citizens, of course, at the end point. But uh, if we don't have a, a standard and regulation level, we uh, are risking to, to, to spend a lot of money for nothing, in a way. Uh, so we have a, a good experience in local ecosystems, but if we scale, for example, I, I refer in my presentation to the case of some ICT market uh, companies that put uh, data together and give uh, some services to the public administrations and to the citizens. Yeah, but uh, two or three of these companies work at the national level. So what is the problem? That they are perfectly integrated with the region Lombardy, but they are, for all the other regions in, in Italy, they could have to spend something to integrate uh, eventually with different uh, uh, APIs and, and, uh, and contents. So uh, for, for the business is uh, a, a risk of, of investment if there is no regulation and standards. There are yeah, no yeah, so reflecting also on on uh, the question on how different uh, member states will be adopting uh, API strategies thanks to the, the implementation of this organ of this uh, directive. I, I think that uh, there were many um, uh, ideas that were uh, common along all the presentations from from our speakers. Uh, API adoption is a journey. Uh, that accompanies uh, organizations in the digital transformation. They can start as small, but then they, they can grow and, and develop. Also reflecting on the question that you were doing uh, to one of the speakers, Con, um, you were talking about the maturity of the ecosystems and uh, when do you consider a, a, an ecosystem mature? Of course, this is nothing, I mean, ecosystem by default are uh, uh, evolutionary uh, environments and they need to be adapting to the new uh, setup of, of conditions. And this is what um, I will expect on, on uh, the public sector. Uh, there will be some species that will, they will evolve uh, more rapidly for uh, whatever reasons, but they will be pioneering uh, the, the way to the path to follow. So uh, most, uh, and, and what we cannot um, say is that there is no, uh, I mean, thing. I think that APIs will be at the, cre uh, at the core of the creation of ecosystems and uh, that, that uh, their evolution will, um, will make, uh, will make uh, the, the, the public sector start becoming uh, an active part of the, of the full digital ecosystem. And uh, yeah, uh, this one is, is the first opportunity maybe to, or not the first, other, other regulations in the past have already proven that uh, 
uh, that for, for instance, the bank banking sector have proven that uh, this evolution just happens. Once when it starts, it starts, it doesn't, uh, it, it just evolves. Yeah, Pinar, you wanna? Um, I think that um, on top of everything, uh, I also want to emphasize that there are some win-win partnerships to make this happen. And so uh, as part of my uh, role as a professor of entrepreneurship, I meet all these fintech entrepreneurs that have the skills and, uh, and the willingness and the strategic view of what can change in the market. And if this can be combined with the vast data sets that are already existing in large institutions, uh, but some great innovation can happen. And I've looked at it in the from the perspective of a large bank and fintech um, partnerships. But I think this story is not very different when it comes to public organizations. So uh, if there is a way to work with uh, uh, smaller institutions uh, that are uh, hungry to innovate but don't have the data, I think this is uh, really important. Mark, you wanted to jump in? Can I, I'll tie in uh, Monica's last comment and Pinar's. So then I think one of the things that's really important is to have a product manager role over that high value data set that's being created as an API. So what that will help as far as Monica was talking about the evolution of an ecosystem. So the product manager will be perfectly placed to be able to be measuring whether or not as that uh, high value data set and the APIs are being released, that it's generating the value that's expected and that it's growing the ecosystem in ways that are, uh, are desirable, you know, uh, leading Europeans innovation, for example, or the country's strengths in being able to diversify products and digital products and services for citizens and so on. And then that product manager also looking at that data around how that's ecosystem is growing can then reach out as Pinar was saying to those entrepreneurs who might be able to fill those gaps or address the new opportunities that are being seen in, as you look at where that value is either being generated or being held back in an ecosystem and being able to then encourage that uh, use of that resource of entrepreneurs and creatives who have the opportunity to then be able to uh, create the new digital products that maybe on that, you know, we talk about with APIs, it's not a matter of build it and they will come. You know, there is also that outreach and working with uh, different sectors in society. It might be about like maybe the intra entrepreneurial sector is using the ecosystems, researchers aren't using the data sets. So maybe it's about going to the researchers or it's about addressing that balance, like I was mentioning around um, in banking where women owned businesses you know, is open banking changing their financing level because old banking wasn't, you know, things like that. So, yeah, so when the, when, if we keep the comparison with the banking sector, you know, the PSD2 directive was in 2013. So it took a lot of time but the, uh, to, for banks to open for many reasons, business reasons and technical reasons. But now the market is really different. And I really, I would really love the Alexander and Frederic point of view about like the current product landscape, like the fact that now we have more platforms to manage APIs, to get this return on investment, to onboard users, to, you know, like to, to be able to, to really manage them as a community versus just sending files like CSV files, uh, you know, as an open data initiative, like some or institution have been done. So, so maybe Alexander and Frederick, like how, how mature do you think the ecosystem is for now managing APIs or helping public sector to publish APIs in a way that is, is controlled? Um, um, Alexander, if you want to jump yeah. on. Yeah, yeah, great question. So um, I, 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 as well, I would say the same as well for product managers. We see product managers in the driver's seat. And actually, those are the ones that are driving how they share and the monetize APIs. Um, and basically, what we have seen from in the last few years, that you have the development of new platforms, like ours, but uh, many different platforms, and uh, historical platforms that are more and more mature either in open source, you share that, uh, uh, or uh, more private uh, solutions. So API management, which is like the core of how you share your API, it's really now um, uh, something that is really easy to implement for uh, anyone. And more now, those tools have been, have been evolving to help other people who, who are not technical people to actually share and monetize their APIs. So there's this big move where um, it was only technical people speaking to technical people. And now the tools have implemented as well the, the, the fact that uh, technical people uh, 
can use those tools, but even non-technical people can look at the value, decide and uh, control how those APIs can be shared, uh, uh, secured and monetized. And I think that's a big change as well in the industry. So I would say that definitely now we see uh, even uh, companies which are not API related, jumping into APIs, building projects in a few weeks and be ready to share their APIs, which before would not have been the, the case. Yeah, I totally share that it's uh, it's way easier nowadays to to have APIs and to manage manage them. But now the that's the main uh, the main challenge. But we are also uh, really focusing on the on the quality and uh, the continuous improvement with the developers about okay, you have the data, you it's way easier now to set up an API out of it. But then um, is your API really ready uh, to use by developers? Because uh, when you publish the data, you can imagine um, an API in a certain way, but maybe it's just not uh, reusable um, uh, directly uh, for developing an application or continuing. So, so you need to, to communicate with your community and to improve uh, it or maybe rebuild it uh, later on uh, based on the feedbacks that you can have extra. So this is a, a topic, but yes, mainly the, the data quality also is a, is a very important uh, stage because sharing through APIs the, the data that is not uh, qualified and, uh, and, and, and good enough can also be, uh, be, be a problem. So you have a all, yeah, yeah make, make, making an API is just a technical uh, way to, to share the data, but then uh, is the data ready to use? Uh, it's not uh, always the case. So, so yeah, it's on your part. Yeah, of, so, uh, so, so we heard API management, probably API security. Uh, we heard community building management. We heard uh, uh, product management. We heard all, all these different topics about APIs and opening having data sets. So for the final words, because time is, is flying, is really going fast. But Marco and Ine, uh, on your side, like, do you think you're already doing it? You're already doing it, but now it has many new facets, like new flavors uh, about the full aspect of APIs. Do you think like public organizations are ready, uh, or what? What's what's the next challenge for at least your organizations in in that in that aspect? Maybe you know you, you can start, or if you want, or Marco, Marco, if you. But we we are on mute, Marco. Okay, uh, in my opinion, uh, public administrations are quite ready, but uh, we have to fo focus on real use cases. Uh, we cannot be ready for everything because uh, in a region uh, we have uh, to face with a lot of, uh, of, of uh, challenges, a lot of uh, industries too, agriculture, uh, healthcare, mobility and so on so we have to try to put a relationship with the private companies what uh, where uh, public administration can't uh, reach the, the goal uh, to to put uh, data and apis uh, the, the the basis of an ecosystem is to uh, have relationship with others that can put their data too not only the administration ones and create uh, use case from the bottom then from the top, the standards. We are working on that. And the other thing I think that is very important is um, communicate the value through examples. Uh, most of uh, um, decision makers, uh, when you told them what is an API, <laughs> have a strange uh, uh, reaction. But what is that? It's a technical thing. No, it's not a technical thing. So we have to uh, let uh, these decision makers, private or public, to understand which is the real value of connecting people and systems, but first people through data. Thank this you. is my point. Marco. Yes, I'm more or less in the same uh, answer. Uh, one of the lessons we learned from Inspire is that use cases are very important and we not only should provide data from uh, 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 what's available, but only if there is a real need. And uh, also then we can um, 
adjust the information models on the need. And now it's more too general. One other important thing is that um, I think uh, the policymakers have to learn to uh, think about uh, data-driven working. And uh, they just started a little bit with that, uh, to think in that way. Uh, that they should use data from other organizations directly when they are uh, making their policy. But uh, I think there's still a long way to go to um, uh, make it part of their uh, daily business and also provide all their own data they um, gather when they are doing their policy making and uh, make it available to other uh, policymakers because they think when they deliver their own uh, results, their own um, reports, then they are finished. But that's mostly the starting point for other organizations. So they have to uh, open their data and uh, so it can be reused. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. For the last 30 seconds uh, we have, I will just ask Alexander Kotsev, right, and Monica, like, just, it's encouraging, you know, we have the tools, we have the mindset, we have the policy, just let's do it, right? Indeed. Uh, everything seems to be, um, uh, starts are aligning. Uh, it will be a process, as, as, as was mentioned. Uh, time will show whether high-value data sets are actually of high value. In some cases, they will be, in some others to a lesser extent. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, participating in this journey together with all of you. And last, last two words for sure is just uh, we can thank enough uh, all, the, all the speakers for the insightful uh, presentations today. We've uh, actually um, overachieved our expectations. We've got a lot of food for thoughts on uh, uh, how the public sector could uh, seize the opportunities that are lying behind the, the efforts that they have to put on, on setting up these infrastructures uh, at technical level, organizational level and coordination. But uh, yeah, as uh, Alex said, uh, we are really excited to, to be a part of this journey. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. We're just five minutes late, but uh, uh, people are really, really understand. Just to say, Marco, a lot of fans of your cat in the comment in the chat, right? So just uh, Marco has left, <laughs> but uh, some comments. Yeah. Thank you very much all for that. So just for all attendees, the slides of, the, of the speakers who accepted to share them will be uh, available. Uh, and the videos will be available in recording for people who could not attend. Thank you very much. Uh, let's open high value data sets, right, by APIs. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks. And yes, that was uh, that was for this webinar on uh, APIs to open high value data sets. The European uh, directive uh, will come in place uh, soon. So I hope you, you really understood that the tooling is ready, the mindset is ready, uh, the sponsorship are ready, the policymakers are ready to, uh, to, 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 to make, to spread the value and have this trickle down economics of high value data sets. Uh, yeah, let's see us each other at another uh, API webinar in partnership with the European, European Commission. Thank you. And